Welcome to Sanya, the southernmost point of China, where 25 competitors, nearly four tons of raw power, will aim to push, pull and lift their way to the final of World's Strongest Man 2006. World's Strongest Man's 30th birthday and once again we've travelled halfway across the globe to celebrate. 14 different countries are represented, the strongest men in the world are ready to lock horns again. We return to China for the second time in succession, but Sanya is a very different proposition to last year's venue, Chengdu. We've moved from the industrial north to the tropical south of the country. Sanya is the beach capital of China. Situated on the bottom tip of Hainan Island, it's China's most southerly city. And we begin the sinew stretching action right on the beach. Your commentators are Nick Halling and Colin Bryce. Well, it's not an easy start for these fellas, the medley. 75 second time limit over 50 metres. First they carry a 220 pound cannonball 25 metres, then a 265 anvil in each hand, the remaining 25 metres. And first up, it's Jesson Paulan, the Canadian, against Harold Haugen of Norway. Just turned 20, this fella. Let's hear from both men. Jesson Paulin. Yeah! Canada. Ah! Carl Haugen, yeah, no way. Take your positions. And off we go. This is the easy bit. <laughs> Try telling that to Harold Haugen though, he's losing his grip already and Paul Ann looks like he's got a pretty good grip but Haugen's recovered very well just to take an early lead. Well, perhaps an experience there. He's running back so fast he could tear a hamstring or something. Very lucky. And now, here's the help you need with the shopping. Oh, Haugen's dropped his shopping. I hope there's no eggs in there. They'll be broken if they are. As it is, it's Jesson Paulan that showed his experience. He paced himself. You hit the nail on the head. A little bit of an experience has really hurt Harold. And once you lose your rhythm, you're in big trouble in this one. Well, a big jolt of adrenaline shot through his body there. And this has become a tortoise and the hare affair. Well, he got there in the end, but won't be very happy with that time. But uh, Paul Ann, 31.53. Well, in the hot sun of the morning, it was so hard to hang on to these uh, black cannonballs. But they don't call Jess and Paul out the grip for nothing. He's never going to let those go. But here's the man who sets the gold standard for this event. The governor himself, Marius Pudzianowski. 300 pounds of Polish power. Three times world's strongest man. There have been favourites for the title before, but very few have dominated this brutal sport quite like this man. Can anybody stop Marius Pudzianowski? Well, here's the fellas that have drawn the short straw. Reza Garay from Tehran. He's in this heat as well, and alongside him, the veteran American Don Pope. Let's hear from these two gentlemen. Reza Garay, Iran. Don Pope, USA. Take your positions! And off they go. The suspicion is it's going to be uh, Pudzianowski all the way, but he's having trouble with Razor. Look at this, Razor's really pushing him. Don Pope is trailing and struggling. It's like a 100-metre sprinter sprinting back there, Pudzianowski. And this is really where he comes into his own. He's so fantastic at the farmer's walk. Well, he's absolutely destroyed that farmer's walk, hasn't he? absolutely destroyed it beat that razor's going to be happy enough he's held off a fast finishing don pope will be disappointed with third polish power says marius we've seen a lot of that 
Well, I think this event has shown us that conditioning will play a role here. And Don Pope perhaps isn't the condition he needs to be. Brzezinowski already has three titles, but on this form he could very well make it four. The big surprise in this first heat, the performance of last year's finalist and one of the favourites this year, Don Pope. Now we're superbly well catered for at a mangrove tree resort in Yalong Bay where ourselves and the athletes are staying. But all the food we eat, in fact all the food everyone in China eats, is bought and sold in places like this. Hello. Hi there. Hello. Oh, on your fingers. Ouch. Don't get any cigarette ash on that. It's the kind of place that few tourists visit, but coming here gives a fantastic insight into Chinese society. <laughs> that is disgusting. Yeah, no, don't you come near me with those hands. Well, Sanya being on the coast is renowned for its seafood, and I can see why. There is absolutely everything here that you could want. Cockles and mussels, we've got crabs down here, all beautifully fresh, prawns, the biggest prawns you could possibly see. It's wonderful, it might not look particularly appetizing, but believe me, this is as fresh as you could possibly want, it's wonderful. Well, when you come to the indoor market here at Sanya, you can see the attraction and the color and the variety of Chinese food. They really have got everything you could possibly want under one roof. We've seen the fresh fish and the meat counters, which were a little bit on the gruesome side, but who am I to complain? And now we have the wonderful colors of these fantastic peppers. I'm not going to try any, because I will cry if I eat one of these, but they have got everything. We've got more vegetables over there, and everyone is quite happy to let you try something out. But as I say, I'm going to give this a miss. These are very hot, yeah? Very hot. Very hot. You would laugh if I ate one of these. Believe me, you don't know what I'm saying. But as soon as I started crying, you would laugh. For the chance to see more grown men cry, join us after the break. We're back on the beach for the keg toss. which, as you all know, means hello in Mandarin. Welcome back to China for the first qualifying round of this year's World's Strongest Man. Now, downtown Sanya may be a million miles away from the hustle and bustle of modern cities like Shanghai, but its inhabitants enjoy some of the cleanest air in Asia, as well as some fantastic beaches. And it's to one of these that we're heading for our second event. It's time for the keg toss from Dadonghai Bay. Sounds so simple, doesn't it? The keg toss, like you could just pick it up and flip it. Well, these guys probably can, the rest of us couldn't. You've got 90 seconds to dispose of 10 kegs that each weigh 60 pounds over a wall that's 14 foot 6. The first man to test himself against the keg toss is Ready? the Razor. Let's see how he gets on here. Well, he goes for the two at a time routine and... The first one is up and over. A lot of technique in this event, Colin. It's not just about power, it's technique too. Well, absolutely, and it's holding your technique over the 90 seconds. I actually think that's, this just might be a task too far. Nearly 30 kilos, and it's the height of a double-decker bus. Um, oh, that fifth one only just made it. So this will be an interesting one. Does this one go? Yeah, you got a bit more behind that. There's a risk if you get this wrong. That keg's going to come down and land pretty near your head if you're not careful. Well done again, that absolutely cleared the 14 foot 6. He's taking a bit more time, but that's good rhythm. Well, he's got 45 seconds left on the clock, two to go. And perhaps his hand's starting to sweat a little now, he's got to keep his cool. Oh, he's in trouble, he's in trouble. And that clock ticks away, he's still got plenty of time. The clock is not his enemy. He goes back to that sort of uh, longer grip, and that doesn't work for him either. And we see this so often when, when the wheels come off, when somebody loses his rhythm, they never get it back, and he has to settle for eight. Having blasted his way through eight, suddenly nine was one too many. Well, there's a man who knew he was beaten. So powerful at the beginning. Incredible pull with the lower back, but he's quite inexperienced, this young man. Now, if experience is what it's all about, 
Well, you're looking at Mr. Experience. Very few Ready. events have ever tested this man. Let's see what Pudzianowski does now. He goes for the one at a time technique. And he's certainly taking his time there. The first one clears as if it was a, a three-foot wall, not a 14-foot six wall. And the second one goes without touching as well. Just look how he picks these barrels up. It's like there's, there's nothing in them. Look at that, effortless. You know, those people standing behind this wall better watch out. One of these kegs might be coming their way. Five over without anything touching that wall and he's barely past 30 seconds. Six. Watching him in training, he was having all kinds of problems, but typical Marius. I wonder if he was playing games because on the day he steps up to the mark. And he's not that tall either, Nick. Under six foot and it's quite hard to get those barrels between his legs. Well, he's matched the razor. He's just surpassed the razor. And he's going to do this in about a minute flat. No, he's taking a little bit of time, so he won't break the uh, one-minute barrier, but 102.35, phenomenal. And one I think you're right. Oh, it's good. Yeah, it's good. There was nothing wrong with that. I think controlled aggression is the term to use with Marius. He's so cool under pressure. Here's Don Pope. Questions being asked about this man's fitness. This is a man who led the world's strongest man for a while last year. Had a little bit of a blow-up. Perhaps he couldn't believe that he was in the lead. Well, a disappointing first event. The farmer's walk in particular really let Don down. But the construction worker from Cleveland, Ohio, makes a very good start. Those first two kegs go over as if they're filled with feathers. But it certainly does help when you're six foot five. He's the tallest man in the heat, and those big long arms are his. In many ways, he's almost wasting too much energy by going so high with them. He'll want to have a better world's strongest man than his American football team have had this season, the Cleveland Browns. Oh, the Browns might want to sign him up with the power he's displaying here. This is not even 45 seconds, and he's got one left. 45 seconds to go! Well, with this, he takes the lead, and he's done it with ease. 49.37. And he's going to show off now. We were talking about a lack of conditioning. Well, he shut us up. Nothing wrong with this man's conditioning at all. Perhaps some big nerves in the first event for Don, but he's proven himself to be a comeback man, and who better to do it in front of than the great Bill Kazmar? Well, you and Marios were kind of going back and forth with a couple slurs or a little bit of excitement. What was going on there? Ah, uh, you know, it's all in good fun. You know, he's a great competitor, and and uh, you know, I don't like being beat in anything. You know, so uh, I just I just want to say, hey, you know, I'll do what it takes to beat you. You know. Well, you did that with 10. What sort of message does it send when you did the 11th one and made it look very easy? You know, I, I just, I see he did 10. I thought he struggled. I just want to let him know I could have did another one. Just as easy as I did 11, so it didn't matter. Popular wherever he goes around the world. French-speaking Canadian, Jess and Paul Ant, it's his turn to Ready? toy with these kegs. I'd love to know what they're full of. They don't seem to be full of anything, the way these folks are disposing of them, but that's not the best of starts. The first one clips the metal. The second one goes over, but we saw certainly Pope and Pudzianowski, they barely touched, so he's got a bit of rhythm going now. I must admit, I saw that first one go through and I thought this fella could be in trouble, but he seems to have settled down. He's not getting much of a swing, is he, between his legs? He's kind of relying on bicep and brute strength power. You wonder whether he'll tire quickly because he's not using his big muscles like his lower back. Oh, it was, it was right, sheer first. momentum that got that last one over there. And that, there it is. There's, there's the problem. Now, we saw what happened earlier. Once you lose your rhythm in this event, you're in trouble. Razor couldn't get his over once he'd made a mistake, and I think it's going to be exactly the same for this fella as well, and quite rightly, he conserves his energy. He has to settle for seven kegs and knew that seven was not a magnificent effort. 
Well, you can see there he's trying to bicep curl it up. Bent arms. Not a very clever technique at all. Harold Haugen. Another one off the Norwegian conveyor belt. Sven Carlsen is going to be my coach in this year's World's Strongest Man. A lot of these events are new for me. And he told me all the secrets about all the events. It's nice to be the youngest competitor and World's Strongest Man. You're starting with the clean sheet. Uh, no one are expecting anything, so whatever I do, I think it will be good. Yeah, you know, all the other guys here are like uh, my idols. One of my biggest goals this year is coming to the final. I beat Marius in one event. To become the world's strongest man, it will mean that my dreams come true. Well, I guess this man is still pinching himself that he's in this company. When you talk to him, you listen to him, he says he's got such respect for <laughs> That one nearly took off. We nearly lost orbit there. That was a phone call to NASA. Well, what a start. And he's shown he's belonged in this company already, but now he's really proving it. That could be 15-6, that wall, and these, bar these barrels would still be going clear. Well, this is incredible. One minute to go. Yeah, he's not going to need a minute. He's going to need about 15 seconds the way he's going through these. There's the ninth, one more to go, and he's still got 10 seconds to do it in. A new best. He said he wanted to just win one event here, beat the great Marius, that might be it. Well, I have to say, that's one of the most incredible displays of explosive power I've ever seen at the World's Strongest Man. And from a man who's just 20 years old, incredible. He cleared it by five feet each time. You just knew it when that first one almost left the Earth's atmosphere that this could have been something special. You're one of the youngest guys here. How confident are you to make it into the final? I will do my best, but all the competitors are so good, so I think it will be very tight and hard to come to the final, but I will do my best shot. Four events to go. Good luck. Thank you. He did it then. Harold Haugen wins an event at World's Strongest Man, and even though Don Pope threw 11 over, he'll have to settle for second. Pujanovski finishes outside the top two for a change. The pole stays in top spot though. Things are looking a little better for Don Pope after his second place finish. Remember, the top two from each group will make it through to the 10-man final. Well, it's not quite the decaf skinny latte that I ordered, but it's warm, it's wet, and it appears drinkable. Anyway, it's time to head over to Nanshan for the deadlift. We'll have two events from the Nanshan Cultural Resort to give it its full title. An oasis of calm containing Buddhist temples and impressive statues. There's nothing calm though about the first test. And so to the deadlift. And Harold Haugen continue where he left off with those kegs the humidity really starting to build and it's not Take so much the position. heat that hurts you as an lift. athlete in these conditions it's the humidity it drains your energy lift good lift he'll be looking to lift. beat 10 good lift lift Paul Ant and good Garai lift. have lift. set the bar good lift can Haugen lift. raise that bar a little bit further Good with lift. this deadlift? And again, it's lift. another event that looks easy, but it's all about Good technique. Lift. Lift. This event is part it's of the in. staple Good diet lift. of any strongman. You train it in the gym, but one of the things that makes it a little bit more difficult is the bar pulls in towards you. It's kind of goofy. And it's not so lift. simple as you do in your gym training. And while it can really uh, cause problems in the lower back, he's managed to equal the 10, though. This is very good going from the young man. And he's confident. He says one more as well. Lift. I wonder if he fancies a couple more. Good lift. There's another. No ref. He takes the lead. Didn't like that last one, though, the, uh, the referee. Well, he lost a rep there. That was uh, real inexperience. He's gone over to discuss things with Sven Carlson. And uh, this is why. Because if you release your grip on the way down, then uh, it doesn't count as a full rep. You can't uh, let it go before the tires touch. That's a shame. So, Pudzianowski knows he has to beat 11. It should have been 12, really. Haugen had done all the hard work. But... 
This fella, if he feels like it, can blitz his way Douglas. up into the teens comfortably. Douglas. What we've seen with Pudzianowski in the past, though, he loves to go last because he knows just how much he has to put into an event. He's still got people to follow him here. So he can't just uh, get to 12 and say that's enough. He'll want to really make the rest of them work. One thing I'm interested to see is uh, there are a few other heats that are doing this event. Perhaps uh, he's going to play mind games here. This might not just be a beating to his others in the heat. This might be a beating to everybody in the entire heat who are taking part. He could push this up towards 15 or 16 to show off here. Douglas! Well, he's looking like he's well capable of it. There he is. He's into the teens as we expected. Uh, that 14th one Less took a little time. bit of effort. 25 seconds. Now, can he pull another one out? Good lift! Lift! Oh, that is... Oh, look at the legs buckling. Good lift! And he's held Less. it. Yeah, 16. Oh, you're right. He's really going for this. Can he do another one? Can he make it 17? Oh. Lift, Timing was perfect. He got his 17th lift in just as the whistle went. Well, if this is a message to everybody else, the message says, be very worried. Pudzianowski's back in shape. Yeah, once or twice there you thought the legs might be going, but no, 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 no. He had total control of his body and of that deadlift. Now what can Don Pope come up with? Didn't start off too well, much better in his second event. The sun burning down on the spectators what? and the competitors here. It's not so much the heat that's going to hurt these guys as the day goes on though. It's the humidity and that is rising. He's a tall man Don, at least six inches taller than Marius. And that traditionally hasn't helped. I like his technique though, he's bouncing down on the suspension. These strong men never miss a trick if they can. Well, clearly it's legal, as you say, he's getting a little bit of momentum out of that, but that's not a place where you want to be stopping. When the bar is set at 17, you don't want to take your first breather at 6. And Don may struggle to hit double figures here. Well, he's got it up to 8, but he's slowed right down. Yeah, he's really feeling this. Lift in your own time, Don. Just under 20. Yeah, he, he may need a while. He's struggling. This is an important one. He's got to try and join those other two fellas at 10. And he's done it. Now, another one would be a real bonus for Pope. No, but he'll settle for 10. Nine would have put him right down to the bottom of the field. But 10 gets him tied for third. That's a very important last lift for Don Pope. It certainly was and gets him that joint third place, but what a masterclass of deadlifting from Pujanovsky. Six reps clear of second place. Harold Haugen's lapse of concentration ultimately didn't do him any harm. It's looking unlikely that anyone will catch Pujanovsky, but the surprise performance so far is undoubtedly that of the Norwegian rookie. We've reached the halfway stage here in Sanya and so far things are going to plan for the reigning champion. Can any of his competitors catch him? Can Harold Haugen upset the form guide in his very first World's Strongest Man? Find out after the break with two more classic events, the car walk and the overhead stone lift. Welcome back, I'm Don Pope, the World's Strongest Man 2006 in Sanya. Don Pope may be smiling at the midway point, but if he wants to keep that smile in place, he'll need to raise his game in the last three events. It's imperative that he gets ahead of Harold Haugen. His first opportunity lies in the spirit-sapping car walk. First up, Justin Paulan taking on an event that we haven't seen at World's Strongest Man since Las Vegas 1997. The car walk, so simple. A 75 second time limit over a 25 meter course. All you've got to do is lift up and carry a car that weighs 900 pounds. Good luck. See, I said it sounds simple, but it isn't. But the one thing that you can do, that you've got to do when you get to this position, is keep those feet moving. If you stop, you are dead. And Paul Ann knows that better than anybody. If you stop, 
that car is going to take you down because you can't defy gravity he's got some momentum how far can he get it can he finish the course this is looking good he's got some rhythm well his balance is a real struggle here he's staggering right to left he's got to be careful not to go out of the lane and now he's gone down he's got the awful position of having to squat it back up he's going back oh no well that's what happens once that car goes down and he's all over the place the car swerving off the road there's not going to be much left here as you say he's got to stay in his lane but the car and gravity look like beating the Canadian here and it's the old old story once you stop you don't start again that car will finish you off 20.2 for the first 15 meters it looked terrific he had a steady pace there but just coming up this grass surface he just lost it so fatiguing this here's that shy retiring nervous not very confident pole Marius Pudzianowski what's the betting Marius just picks this car up and got breaks into a run well even he has to treat this one with respect but he's taking much bigger steps. Look how much, look how far ahead he's going with his left leg. He is coming up a slight incline as well. That can't be forgotten. 420 kilos, 900 pounds. Even the great Pudzianowski struggling. Well, he's going to finish it. Yeah, he did. I thought he was going to finish it without a break. 26:44 is uh, a very tidy time indeed. He goes into the lead in this one. Well, Marius has outstanding leg power, but even he is struggling with this heavy weight, and that uh, will send out a message to the more inexperienced men like Reza here that this is very, very hard. But Reza will also have seen that there was a stumble there from Pudzianowski, so anybody that can pick this car up and keep it moving has got a shot at the lead here. But Razor started slow. He started very slow. This doesn't look good at all. The early signs are not encouraging. He's not going to beat that time. He's not going to get far at all. You saw it from the moment he took that weight. His eyes gave it away. It was as if he was saying, what on earth have I got myself into here? And this is a real triumph of the will that he's got anything going at all. This has caught Razor by surprise, hasn't it? It has indeed. I mean, he's got incredible leg power. He's got Middle Eastern powerlifting records, with huge squatting power, but it's being able to move your leg one after the other. It's not uh, two at a time as it is in the squat. And it really does find out who's got the athletic ability, the core strength that so many physios and sports scientists talk about. Look at that. He's gone for the wide stance, but that's car, I don't think, is going another millimeter. He's got to try and get it to 2020 to uh, edge out Paul Ann, but he's not going to do it. This car has beaten him. You knew it from the moment he took the strain. This is not his preferred mode of transport, is it? The car barely got off the drive. Well, Reza was really struggling moving this forward. He's put up a brave display. I, I don't suppose he's got this piece of kit back home in Iran, has he? Harold Haugen up next. What a terrific start he's had. How easy he made those 10 kegs look. Well, having disposed of the kegs, it's a very different challenge now. And, oh dear, just as we saw with Reza, this, that doesn't look too good at all. Now he's got to forget all about Pudzianowski and what he did. He's got to think, get to 20 metres and try and get second place. But the way this has started, he's got to just think about maybe getting past Razor because he's all over the shop already. Well, he's very, very powerful, but I think the heat might be beating him here. He was really struggling in the tent beforehand, and I don't suppose the young Vikings used to 35 degree weather. I don't know what Haugen's saying to himself. We haven't had this event since 1997. And can we please wait another nine years before we have it again? There's always some event in Strongman that seems to sort you out. That's what's made Tuzhinovsky so magnificent over the years. There is no event that absolutely baffles him. And Haugen just doesn't want to know. And there is a time to cut your losses and just get the hell out of there. 
he will be very, very disappointed with that. But it was bad from the first moment. He didn't even make it a third of the way. 7.6 meters is a huge disappointment for the Viking, who's now going to have to dig deep. The construction worker from Cleveland flying the flag for Uncle Sam. It mean a lot to me to be the next American to win it. Well, there's been a big void. You know, it's been over 20 years, and it's about time for it to be back in the States. A lot of it is mental. The stuff that you put your body through, the training that goes into this, you must be a couple bricks short of a load. You know, you can't be all there to be a strong man. I'm tired of guys coming up to me and saying, you know, who's that big blonde Swede guy? It's blah, 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 you know? It's like, yeah, it's Magnus Samuelson, and he's blah, blah, blah. Well, who's that? That dude that's ripped to the bone and he's huge and he looks like he's 400 pounds and he blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, that's Marius Brujanowski, you know, blah, 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 you know. I want people to say, who's that big, bald, goatee, overly attractive American, you know? And they're like, oh, that's Don Pope. You, you don't never know who that is? It's, it's my turn now, you know? Ready! Ready! Well, like all Americans, Don Pope talks a good game. But as we say on this side of the Atlantic, it is time to put up or shut up for Don. Got some rhythm, got some momentum. And he should comfortably take third place here because of the problems that Harold and Razor have had. Can he get past Paul Ann? 2020 was Paul Ann's distance. He's not going to beat Marius. We kind of knew that before it had even begun. But 2020 is the significant uh, milestone for Don. He's still got some work to do. But he's doing okay. I'm amazed the way he's able to bully the car back into a straight line there. He really wants this. And there's no doubt about it. He's one of the most popular men on the scene. I think everybody would like to see Don make it to the final. And he's done the smart thing as well. I think he'd think, yeah, he wanted second place and that was always going to be enough for him. And he took it. Clever, strategic planning and thinking there from Don Pope. Why waste your effort? Well, being able to bring it back into line, he's almost shoving it with the wheels on the ground. Sheer determination on his face. Don, you were all over the course. How tough was this event? It was tough, you know. Uh, you know, the fastest seatbelt thing kept coming on, and so I had to, no, It was just, uh, it's grass, you know. Grass is hilly and humps, and it's uphill. So, uh, you know, it's been over 100 degrees here. So I'm a little dizzy walking from the finish to the start line to start out. So, well, good luck to you the rest of the way. Thanks. Marius, the only one to finish the course, and he continues to dominate. A winning margin of two meters, but for Don Pope, it's enough to secure him a valuable second spot. Harold Haugen will be disappointed with his efforts. Pujanowski looks unstoppable once again. He needs just three points from the final two events to qualify for yet another World's Strongest Man final. The main fight now is the one for second place. Don Pope is the man in form. You need more than that! Will Harold Haugen's lack of experience count against him? High spirits from Don Pope, now he needs to maintain his form in our next event. The competition moves to the fabulous Yalong Bay Golf Club for the overhead lift. Let's rejoin Nick Halling and Colin Bryce. Thanks Martin, some of us are uh, hoping to see you have a go at an event sooner rather than later. Anyway, moving swiftly on, the overhead lift, 90 seconds, the stones go up in weight, the athlete who finishes the quickest with the most lifts is the winner. Well, we already had two men try their arm at this event, and neither has really impressed. Neither Harold Haugen, nor indeed the Canadian. Yes, and Paulan managed to lift a single stone, much to the disappointment of the Canadian. Ah, so Don Pope's in a... He's, he's on easy street here, isn't he, Colin? He, he knows one lift, and he's, he's, he's in second place Ready? immediately. The, the failures of the others in front of him have put him in that situation. He's got colossal shoulders as well, Don, and this is a really good chance for him to make some headway against the others. Look how easy that is. That's over 100 kilos. He takes the lead, just like that. But uh, 
Just in case Don was going to start getting overconfident. Guess what, Don? Those stones get heavier. And doesn't he feel it already? Now, well, let's see if he can get the lift here. He, oh, no, he doesn't. Or does he? Well, you heard the referee say good lift. Well, that's interesting. A split second later, and they might have called that one back. Well, all he's got to do is lock it out for a split second. It's a very difficult event, so the referees aren't making it too hard for them. He's just got to lock the arms out. That's up over 120 kilos. Remember, these were made by a gravestone maker. <laughs> and, uh, there's a, I'm sure there's a joke in there somewhere. <laughs> Well, you better not make it to Don Pope right now, because it would be your funeral if you did. And you... Pope hoping to bury this one. 294 pounds for Stone 4. Oh, look at that! He's got it! That's impressive. And he sent a little message to you-know-who with that one. Well, I'm sure a lot of people at home are grimacing watching this, but I think he proved himself on 135 kilos the last stone, just how strong he is. He did look a little wobbly on the others, but on the big one, no problem. Don, on a slight slope, how difficult did that make this event? Uh, you know, that, that even makes it uh, even harder to balance, you know? Uh, you know, odd shape, you're on a hill, you don't know where to put your feet. You know, it ain't like we're doing this fresh either. You know, we've done a lot. I even broke out the special sunglasses for the my pressing sunglasses because I got a little worried. Well, with the top two going through to the final, I don't think uh, Reza Garay from Iran is going to be uh, bothering us for too much longer. But he's been a lot of fun. He's proved very co popular. And I think he's gained an awful lot of experience playing with the big boys here in Sanya. Let's hope he can finish on a high. Good lift! Well, that uh, immediately puts him past two of the competitors in this event. He moves into second place behind Don Pope. Well, that might be as far as he goes. Yeah, this is a struggle. No, no he didn't get it, and he knew no. it. Well, the referee, he had a little look at the referee as if, so you're going to give me that, but there's no way he locked, that, he locked those elbows there. So he's got to go and do it again. I've enjoyed watching this fella, Colin. This man's got a future. He's got a real oh, future. Man. He's a great power lifter from back home in Iran, and he's only turned the strongest man in the last uh, year. It, he was never going to get that up again. Of course, once you've attacked it once and failed, you start to see stars, and when you get that happening, all the blood rushing to your head and shoulders, you're never going to lift it again. They're so awkward as well. You really can't uh, say just how awkward they are. Oh, Marius leading after four events basically just needs two stones Ready. to assure himself a place in the final but Don Pope would just love to win this event and he'll be willing Marius not to take that fourth stone or if he does get the fourth stone not to do it in a faster time so this stone to assure Marius Budzianowski a place in the final it's not even an issue is it oh or oh, did we speak too soon Budzianowski struggling on stone two that's headline news. Now, does he get it at the second attempt? This is interesting. Good lift! Yeah, he got there. But he's mortal. And knowing Pudzianowski and the way he paces himself, he won't even be going after Don Pope here. I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if he just kind of gives a half-hearted little look at this. Or is there a bit of pride in there after all? Well, let's see. There's nothing really to be gained from this. But there is some pride at stake. Well, in many ways, they're getting heavier, but it's actually the second stone that's the most difficult because the weight's so high. This is actually quite an evenly spread out weight, this final stone. And if he can get it up and get his hands onto it, you think Pudzianowski would do it. Oh, well, he didn't get his arm straight, did he? Yeah, that fourth stone proved to be his gravestone, and that event's going to be in the final as well, so it'll be interesting. Don Pope takes the overhead lift. Must be something to do with those shades. Don Pope takes all five points, but look who's right behind him. There's more disappointment for Haugen and Paulin, but Reza Garay did at least manage one successful lift. With Don Pope and Pujanowski picking up nine points between them, we already have our qualifiers from Group 1. Harold Haugen will be disappointed following good early form, but at 20 years old, he's a huge future prospect. 
Finalists may be decided, but the action is far from over. After the break, it's barrel loading. Welcome back to Sanya for the final part of show one, where we have a very special version of barrel loading for you. Marius Putinovsky and Don Pope are already through from this group, but the whole field will be giving it their all here. Sounds simple enough, doesn't it? Carry three barrels and put them on a platform, all within 90 seconds, but there are some very special adaptations this year. Now I've left the comfort of the hotel pool to come down here and have a look at this event with the mighty Kaz. Bill, they've changed things a lot this year. What are the biggest challenges these guys are going to face? Well, Martin, first off, they're carrying through water. And underneath the water is the sand, and it's soft. So every stride they take, it's going to fall away from them. A balance is really going to be a problem. Now, there's a lot of tactics, I would have thought, that you can bring into play in an event like this. What are you looking for the guys to do? Well, it's going to be how they carry the barrel. If they put it on their shoulder, that's probably going to exhaust their whole body. If they can carry it at their hips, they may save a little bit of energy. But towards the end, then they've got to pick it up and put it on the platform. So it's six of one and a half dozen of the other, depending on how the guy's built. If he's taller, he might carry it lower. If he's shorter, we'll see. Well, only time will tell. It promises to be a great test. We'll wait and see how they get on. Yeah, thanks, Martin. Well, uh, Jess and Paulan was the first man to go in this one. The Canadian went on his own and he adopted that shoulder carry technique that you heard Bill Kazmaier talking about. And the Canadian would take two barrels in just over a minute. Decent effort. Harold Haugen started yes. brightly, then faded. That car really sealed his doom. And uh, Reza Garay, third place after five events. He shows he, he's proved he belongs in this company. Ready! And if this may not be his year, well, a future year might not be too far away. And they've really gone out flying here, haven't they? Well, we saw him have some fun with the barrels earlier, Harold. But those were 30 uh, kilo barrels, not 100 kilo barrels. 100 is uh, a much different proposition. And in this personal battle for third place, remember, uh, the big two cannot be caught. But it's uh, the Iranian that looks like he wants to hold third place. He's got a good start here. This is a very deceptive event. It's so soft, the sand under the water, that... You're almost like walking in treacle there. It's so tiring. And Harold Auger now trying to adopt a different technique. You wonder if that's going to work. Well, it is working for him. He's caught up on an awful lot of ground. Oh, no, no, that's another mistake. Uh, we've seen this a couple of times from Haugen. A lack of experience. Remember that deadlift, he let one go. He could have had 12, and he settled for 11 with a little lapse. And that was another mistake. 30 seconds to go! So whatever happens here, Haugen will come out of this knowing that he could do even better, but now it's a sprint. Who can get that last barrel? And poor old Razor looks like he's in trouble. And Haugen's in trouble too. These fellas have given it everything, and isn't it good to see that they're giving it everything they've got with the last 10 seconds of the competition. Haugen's going to hold him off. Will it be good enough for third place overall? Now, can Harold finish it? No. Yes! <laughs> Just three quarters of a second remaining, and Haugen has conquered that particular discipline. That'll give him an awful lot of pride, and Razor wasn't disgraced. Well, some people were calling for four, if not five, barrels in this event, and I think those people are now saying, thank goodness it's just three. This is a brutal event. Thanks, Polski. Czech finale, czwarty się szykuje. Puchinovsky safely through, as is Don Pope. That's why these two fellas can relax. But you know that Don Pope will want to put down a little marker here for the final. Any time you can get an edge on Puchinovsky, you take it. So there might be a little bit more edge to this event than uh, you would have thought. This isn't going to be a, a nice leisurely afternoon in a swimming pool for these two fellas. Puchinovsky's uh, jumped out nice and early. Pope's taking his time. They go for that different lift technique. Who gets the advantage here, or is it just personal preference? Well, I think Marius is trying to just uh, buoy the barrel in the water a little bit there. Perhaps it'll take some of the weight away, of course, as he comes out of the water, though. It's very hard on the biceps, and Don has it up on his shoulders. Perhaps the legs take the weight, so I think it's a bit 50-50. Yeah. Oh, those shades, they've had to go. 
and uh, Pope's certainly taking his time. Kuchanovsky's not exactly uh, in any great hurry. Remember, there is a time to beat here. Well, Sir Arold managed to get in just inside the 90 seconds, so it's not about distance this one. They've got to beat the clock, and uh, I'm not sure that uh, Pope's not going to do it, that's for certain. I'm not sure that Pudzianowski's going to beat that time, and I'm not sure he's that bothered. No, I'm sure he isn't. Pudzianowski knows he's very fit, and I'm sure he could have done this a lot quicker if he had to. This is a man who does up to two hours a day of cardio cycling work and then plays a game of rugby at the weekend for his local Polish <laughs> rugby club. He'll be showing Martin Bayfield a few tricks, won't he, before he's done here. He's happy. Marius has seen off Don Pope. That's all he wanted to do here. He's actually going to get very close. As you say, if he'd found another gear, he'd have done that. <laughs> no, Marius. We'll say it from the safety of the commentary box. You did not get in in time. Didn't miss by much, though, did he? <laughs> Marius and Don will both hope to be making some waves in the final. Harold Haugen with another heat victory. His ambition was to get one, he goes home with two. Look out for him in the next few years. Confirmation then of the first two contestants for the 2006 final. Don Pope qualifying for the second year running, and there are no surprises at the top of the leaderboard. Pudzianowski qualifying with consummate ease. Well, Marius, congratulations. First job done, you're through qualifying into the finals. How hard did you have to push yourself to do that? Oh, this is only qualifying. It's also, it's a heavy job because it's also for five, five strong athletes. I uh, this year easy. I go, I, I go to final. A uh, final, I don't know. It's also next hard job. Well, congratulations to you. Now we know that Marius is through to the final, and that Don Pope is going to join him there as well. To find out who gets through from the next qualifying group, join us next time. And that's tomorrow night at 8. Next tonight, our five-movie premiere for New Year's Eve, Nicolas Cage stars in Adaptation. To see what gems await us in our first event, let's head over to Dadong High Bay. Your commentators are Nick Halling and Colin Bryce. Yes, thanks, Martin. Here is how the carry and drag works. You've got 75 seconds to carry a 220-pound cannonball 20 metres, drop it in the sled, then drag sled and cannonball back the remaining 20 metres. The guy who does it fastest gets the win. And the two men that we're going to meet first to take on this challenge are the Latvian Rivis Vidzis, the 30-year-old from Riga, and last year's finalist from Minneapolis, Minnesota, Big Dave Ostland. Rivis Vidzis. Latvia. Dave Aslan, USA. Take your positions! Well, it's the first time we've seen this event. It's in blistering temperatures as well. And uh, these fellas are certainly making short work of the first part. How are they going to get on with the second part? Now, this, is, this looks a little bit more demanding. They both blasted their way through the carry part, but the drag is uh, proving to be just that, a bit of a drag. The friction of these sleds is enormous. You'd think the body weight of Austin would help him here, but it isn't. It's the leg power of Vincis. He's really attacking this hard, the Latvian. And Dave Austin seems to have got a kind of funny technique there. He's trying to pull it with his arms when he should be doing it with his legs. We've seen this before with the big fella. Size sometimes is not an advantage in strongman. Those longer limbs don't always help you. The Latvian is going to get it done. It's just really sort of a real heave and hope. And it's enough. 51.17. Well, that is something to shout about. Dave just wants to get this over with. This is not the start the American was looking for. He's going to get there in the end as well. But it's become like a rowing event, hasn't it? It's... Uh, yeah, that says it all. That picture says it all. This is not the start the big man needed. And he didn't make it. 30 centimetres to go when the whistle went. But uh, Vidzis, that's a positive start. 51.17. 220 kilos being dragged along this sticky surface. Very hard indeed. And Dave Austin's shoes, they slipped a little. That didn't help. 
Uh, heat two features uh, our own Terry Hollands, the pride of Dartford, and he's up against uh, Gu, the taxi driver from China. Ah! <laughs> we'll get plenty of local support. We've seen him before. He's a lovely, lovely character. As is the big man here, Terry Hollands, 27 years old, all 27 stone of him, an ex-rugby player as well. And rounding up our quintet, the American Jesse Marunde. Oh yeah, Lee. China. Terry Holland. England. Jesse Marundi. USA. Take your positions! Well, English interest in the uh, man in yellow here. Oh, Marunde's off to an absolute flyer. We're not expecting much of a challenge from Gu, and that's how it's worked out so far. But uh, Terry's made up some of that ground that Marundi had early, and now it's going to be a sprint. It's Hollands that's got the early jump. Remember, 51.17 to beat, and Hollands is tearing this apart. But Marundi's flying too. These times are both going to be very fast. Unless there's a breakdown here, it's one and two. England and the United States, that's fast from Terry Holland, look at that, 26.91 and Marundi was only just behind him as well, Gu is somewhere way way back, we weren't expecting a challenge from him, but we weren't expecting two efforts like that from Marundi and Hollands. Marundi really came into this banking on this being a win, he didn't think Terry Hollands would be anywhere near as quick as he, he was there, incredible foot speed by Hollands. And of course those size 19 shoes sticking firm to the ground as he dragged that sledge back. Well that's exactly the start the big fella wanted. Yeah, Marundi got the jump, but that almost kick-started Terry. And once the big man from Dartford got going he impressed everybody, even someone like Bill Kazmaier no doubt. What physical changes have you made this year coming in? Um, well, I knew it would be hot here, so obviously sort of needed to work on the fitness a bit from last year. It's one area where I was really lacking, so just spent a lot of time doing a lot of fitness, running a lot of medleys, try and build it up a bit. I was going side to side because I was worried about falling over. I had a little stumble at first. I fell over on the first event last year. Didn't want to make the same mistake again. Holland's missed the final by a single point last year. He'll be determined to stay in the top two spots this time. A solid performance from Jesse Marundi, qualification the absolute minimum goal for him. Terry Hollands has gone from a promising under-21 rugby player to a contender for world's strongest man. But for him, the journey from rugby pitch to strongman wasn't that complicated. For me, it just felt like a natural transition. Um, obviously, sort of playing rugby and stuff, my weight was always an issue. Um, Whereas this, obviously, the weight can be an advantage if you can still move with it. Um, there was guys trained at my gym that were strong men, and, and um, I remember sort of thinking to myself, I'm stronger than him. So, end of my first competition, it all went from there. Like millions of viewers, Hollands was bred on a diet of British success in World's Strongest Man. Memories that inspired him all the way to China. I think it's, it's a, a national tradition in England to sort of watch it on telly at Christmas. I remember as a kid growing up watching Jeff Capes and other guys um, competing back then. As I got older I sort of lost interest in it a little bit, taking my own sport a bit more seriously. But I started watching it a few years back, sort of early 2000, 99-2000, um, that sort of time. And um, yeah, just I always loved the sport and but just never actually thought I'd be doing it. Well, Britain's strongest man is certainly doing it this year. One event gone and sitting pretty at the top of the leaderboard. There may be a long way to go, but what would emulating capes mean to him? Um, yeah, it mean everything. All, all the hard work's paid off. Um, I mean, I train really hard for it. and I mean, I really enjoy the sport. I think it's great. I mean, but winning the title of World's Strongest Man is sort of a real big achievement, I think. Being a strong man isn't always about lifting heavy stuff. Occasionally we get some time for relaxation. Welcome back to the show. Jesse Marundi's relaxation time won't last long. Next up is the keg toss, the competition guaranteed to get pulse rates going. Ten 30 kilogram kegs, one wall, 14 foot six high, 
and it's a rhythm event. It really is. You've got 90 seconds to toss those cakes over the wall, and it's the most cakes in the fastest time that wins. And we've seen in previous Strongman, it's all about keeping momentum going. And that's exactly what Terry Hollands is going to want to do here. He had that fast start in the carry and drag. What can he do with the kegs? Well, he's taking the one-at-a-time approach. We've seen other athletes, and he's really taking his time as well here. That's a terrible start for the big fella. Dear, oh dear. Well, no wonder he took his time. I don't think he really fancied this. He's in all sorts of trouble here. Terry is going to do well to lift this one keg. Well, he's got there. But that took 25 seconds. And some of these athletes in this field will get through half the kegs in that time. Somehow he's got another one over. Well, I don't think anybody did more training at this than Terry. He was doing so much over the last couple of days here down at the hotel yard. And while it's almost paralysis by analysis, he was trying so many different techniques. And uh, now on the day, obviously the technique he's picked is not really not very good at all. And I tell you, the likes of Jesse Murunde and Dave Osland and... Uh, Rivis Vidzis will be looking at this and saying, hey, we're back in business here. Because Terry's three, oh, he's, oh, that was so close. He's still got time to put a couple more over, and he's certainly not giving up. He's unlucky. He really is. If that had been a 14-foot uh, wall, it'd have been okay, but uh, he may struggle to get four. Yeah, I think that's it, and he's given it up and said, you know what, that's not my event. Three kegs. It's not good. Well, this is five foot higher than a basketball net, and these really are extremely heavy, but I don't think there's any excuse here for Terry. He'll be extremely angry at himself. He knew he lost his call there. And that will have given the others in this field something of a boost, because the leader, Ready. after one event, has struggled. Here's the guy who's in second place, and he's going for that two technique. Get two in position before you start going to work, and as you see, the difference right away. The first keg goes over without even touching the wall. Now, that's interesting. Some guys like to hold it long ways. Others like to sort of hold it uh, horizontally. Marunde is just tossing them over as if they weighed, well, five kilograms, not 30. He's a very explosive athlete, Jesse Marunde, former tight end for Montana State before turning to strongman. So you know he can sprint very fast with that huge bulk. And this really is uh, setting some sort of context on Terry Holland's effort. You knew three was never going to be enough. But having said that, I don't think we expected anything quite like this from Marunde. He's going to beat a minute. And he's done it comfortably as well. 53-73. That is absolutely sensational. I train. Four. Well, the organizers of this contest are really trying to hit on every different type of strength, and this is all about explosive power. Jesse Marunde has it in bag loads. He certainly does. Very impressive stuff from Jesse Marunde. Jesse, massive effort. How tough was it? Uh, the hardest part about that event is the heat. It's got to be 110 out right now. There's no wind. The humidity is really high. Uh, it was much more of a cardiovascular event than I expected. Tell us about your technique. You took two at a time from the end, from the sides. What was best for you? Well, I thought about it real hard in training, and I just I felt like I had enough power to do it that way. That way it's a little bit harder, I think, but it's faster, and uh, I just wanted a good time. I was going for speed there. You think that time will hold? Uh, Dave is quite good at this event, so I really saw him as uh, my number one rival in this event in my heat. Uh, I, it should be close. Well, that was awesome. Keep it up. Thanks. Well, unfortunately, Goo failed to manage a barrel, so next up it's the other American, Dave Ostland, the man from Minneapolis, one of the tallest men in strongman. Made an impressive debut last year, and here he is back for more. I was really happy to make the final last year. You know, I've dreamed about that since I was a kid. I really came down to that last event on the stone. My attitude was just, just win that event and don't worry about the rest of the stone. It worked out for me. 
I have dreams about being World's Strongest Man someday. This is the big show that you train for. It's a whole lifestyle that you maintain for 12 months. You just have to be on all the time and try not to make any mistakes. I think I had a great run last year, and I think I can do even better this year. Well, you would think a man with this height advantage would have a big, big advantage in an event like this. Let's see if it pans out that way. Here comes Big Dave. And it's all about rhythm. You missed that first one. I'm talking of missing the first one. He's done just that. Just like Terry Hollands. And now he's got it going. And that really was a surprise. Well, he's got two, but any chance of uh, beating the 53-73 of Jesse Marunde surely has gone with that early miss. That was an error. Well, you know, Austin's trained this many, many times leading into this competition. He's one of those few strongmen who actually, from a young man, wanted to become world's strongest man and just trained it as a kid. He didn't actually do any other sports, so, you know, he's a real tactician. He's only just getting away with some of these barrels. I think these next ones might prove difficult. A lot of those are hitting the rim and going over. There's another one. He's just getting that extra little bit of height, and that's carrying them. But they're all just clipping it. And as the energy starts to drain, he won't get that height. But he's got two to go. And there it is. There's the evidence. You could see it coming. I'll be very surprised if this one clears. Uh, he's put a lot into that. This is where that early miss is really going to hurt him. Big Dave is going to have to settle for eight unless he can do something very special here. Oh, it was close. Big effort from Dave there. He's all hot the last 30 seconds. He didn't get one over, but he didn't give up. And you have to be very impressed with his effort. Uh, next up is uh, the last man in the competition, uh, Ravis Vidsis of Latvia. Ready. The second smallest in the competition after uh, the 5'11 Goo, who we saw fail to get a barrel. So, having said that, Dave Ostland, with his great height advantage, he didn't clear all ten. So, oh, that doesn't look too good. You did think, looking into this one, that uh, this wouldn't be one of Vidsis' best events because of that height disadvantage, but the first one goes. His problem there in the first one, he certainly had plenty height. It's all about getting the peak of the arc up and over the center of the apparatus. And that's where Ravis Vidzis was just getting it wrong. You can snatch at it a little early and throw it straight up and down. Yeah, you're quite right. There is just so much technique to this particular event. And there is such a risk of wasted energy because you could, as you say, get the height of the arc. But if you've not got the barrel in place to clear the wall, it's all wasted effort. And it's probably no worse feeling than seeing one go up is easily high enough and kick back down at you. It's the panic feeling. As you know, time's running out. But uh, having seen both Ostland and Vidzis stumble coming out of the blocks on this one, I think uh, Terry Hollands will be a little bit disappointed that both of them got their game together enough to go past the Dartford man. And the only question now is how many more has Vidzis got in his tank? That one only just made it. And I think that might be his last one. He needs two more to tie Ostland, and he's not going to do it. Uh, a big six for Vidzis. <coughs> so there's a happy man. Very impressive indeed from Jesse Morunde. An awesome display of athleticism and power from Jesse Marundi means he's the only man to get all ten kegs. Terry Hollands thought he would do badly, and he was right. Just three barrels from the man from Kent. That all means Marundi takes over at the top of the leaderboard. Terry Hollands keeps second spot, just ahead of the American Dave Ostland and Ravis Vidzis. Hollands will be keen to get back to an event that he knows. His first chance for recovery comes in the deadlift. Yes, thanks indeed, Martin. Uh, so far, we've had two contestants have a go at this one, and they didn't do as well as they would have hoped. China's Gu Yanli found it uh, very hot indeed. He didn't trouble the scorers. He'll be so disappointed. And Dave Ostland did a little better, but you've got to think double figures to set any kind of target here, and Dave's eight probably not going to put him in contention for major points.
Up next, it's uh, Vidzis, who's got that squat body. That's terrific for powerlifting. Let's have a look at his technique. Take your position! Grip vital, of course. Ready, lift. If you haven't got that element right, Good you're lift. not going to do anything. Lift. Eight to beat. Good lift. Lift. I think Good Vincent lift. himself would admit this lift. is his best event in the gym. Lift. He's lifted up lift. over 380 kilos. That was Good for lift. one off. This is 320 lift. kilos for reps. And Good remember, lift. Marius in the first lift. group managed 17. So Good I lift. think anything around 12 lift. or 13 is world class. Absolutely Good right. Lift. You get it into the teens. Lift. That's some uh, some serious deadlifting. And just look at these guys' quads. He's got so lift. much power in his quads and that's what really helps him here but I'm surprised he's had to take a breather at nine usually once they take a breather there's only two or three left in the tank well he's got up to 11 you've got to hold on to it all the way down now how many more has he got no that's uh five seconds left no he's gonna stop at 11 funny you expected more from Vidzis there that's a very strong event for him 11 gives him the lead in this heat but looking ahead to the final, wow, you would certainly expect more from him. Amazing, you go in the lead and you're probably a little disappointed. He attacked those barrels so hard in the previous event, so many wasted attempts there, and I think it's just taken the toll on his hamstrings and back. Well, the good news for Vitsis is that Jesse Marunda is up next, and this isn't one of his greatest events, and uh, get the earplugs out because... Uh, Jesse's wife Callie is here, she's his wife and his trainer, and she offers vocal encouragement when her husband's going to work. You Good may lift. hear her. 11 to beat. It's not one of his favourite events. Good lift. Come on, babe. Lift. <laughs> there you go. There's Callie. Good lift. Four. Lift. Come on, baby. Let's go. Hips through. Good lift. You knew Five. you were going to be hearing from lift. Callie sooner rather than later. In fact, you don't need to hear from us at all, do you? We'll just shut up and let Come her on, do it. Baby. Good lift. Six. <laughs> But this is a struggle. In your own time. Come on, baby. This is never going to be a good event for Jesse. It's always been one of his weak spots. He's got a very long back. He's tall. And his arms aren't particularly long. Ideally, you want to be something like a gorilla, really. <laughs> very short legs, extremely long arms. And then you only have to stand a couple of inches up with it. Well, somehow he's got to eight. Needs three more to tie Vidzis, and that's not going to happen. He'll settle for eight, puts him into second place with Terry Hollands to come. Come crew, baby. But Jesse will just be glad to get that one out of the way. And eight means a kiss from the missus. Just as well he didn't get into the teens, I guess. So Terry Hollands knows what he's got to do. We've well, had a bit of everything from Terry so far, haven't we? We've got a... Take your position! A terrific start from him, and then a bit of a disaster with the oh, barrels. Lift. What do we get this time? Good lift. 11 lift. to tie for the Good lead. Lift. And if Terry's sensible, Good if he's lift. got it in him, lift. he'll stop at 12. Good lift. Lift. Good lift. I think 12 will be very hard for Terry. He's a good, good deadlifter, but lift. let's not forget, former rugby player, he's only been Good doing strongman for a couple lift. of years now. And oh, this is yes. one of these things where it really does build up with time. Look at this, he's had to stop at seven. That's usually a bad sign. There's only two or three available to him after a stop, so he, he's going to do well to get into double figures, but this for ten. Now, can he find two more? This is a tremendous recovery from Terry. And he's tied for the lead. Ten now, does he go for one more in that 10 second? He's going to he's gonna try and put Vidzis th down. Good and lift. he's done it as well. Terrific effort from uh, no Big Ten. No content. rep, says the referee. Time. That last one rep. won't count. Watch it back. Mate, I, I dropped. I still have my hands on the bar. Well, he's saying he had his hands on the bar, but it means he has to tie with Vidzis. Some controversy here. Terry, you were going for the outright lead there. It looked like you had it. What happened? Um, I'm not really too sure. He called good lift at the top. Presumed it was a good lift, lowered it down, let it drop a bit, but kept my hands on the bar like we was told to do earlier. He didn't give the rep, um, said that I just dropped it and let go of it. At the end of the day, the referee's decision's final. It's pretty tough to keep your temper out there. Mm, yeah. You, um, showed, you showed really great strength. Yeah, yeah, it's just frustrating when something like that happens, that's all. 
Are you going to look back at the tape now and maybe review, have this reviewed? Yeah, I've, I've, I've actually asked him if I can, but we'll see what happens. Like I said, the referee's decision's final, so whatever he decides, I'll stand by it. Unfortunately for Hollands, the referees were unanimous on the decision. Terry just let go of the bar and in doing so, missed out on a valuable first place. Things are very tight at the top of Group 2 now, and Hollands may be remembering the point that cost him a place in the final 12 months ago. Ravis Vitz's performance has put him in with a real chance. Join us after the break for one of the most dramatic World's Strongest Man events. Yes, it's Fingal's Fingers time. Now, the Hawaii of China is also the center of its pearl industry. Here at the Sanya Pearl Fields, they have every type of pearl oyster you could imagine. In these two pens, we've got the tiddlers. They're just getting going. We're not too interested in them. As we move along, they increase in size, quality, and price. In this pen, we have the black pearl oysters. Very exotic, very beautiful, very expensive. But in here, well, this is strongman after all. We have the monsters of the pearl oyster world. The largest pearl ever pulled out of these waters back in 1985, 25 millimeters, huge. Just imagine what this big bad boy could produce in a few years time. Well, it's about the size of one of Mary's Pujanowski's biceps at the moment, and it's only gonna get bigger. It could be amazing. Time to find out if the rest of this field can match those biceps then, as we return to Nan Shan for the Fingal's Fingers. Your commentators are Nick Halling and Colin Bryce. And I can tell you that a couple of these Fingal's Fingers are even taller than Martin Bayfield. They're not as heavy though. Or right, I'm only kidding. How many of them can you flip in 75 seconds? Well, first up, Gu Yan Li. He has the disadvantage because he is in last place of going first but he has the huge advantage of being in his own backyard. Take your position! Not much expected from Gu. How much will this support help him in his second year of Strongman? Wonderful, colourful character. Always has a smile on his face, no matter how much he struggles. He's got one finger over. Technique again plays such a big part here. You've got to keep pushing. Once that finger drops onto the shoulder, that's usually it. You might as well just drop it and give it up. But he's done well here. He's got his second one down. He managed two last year. So he's managed to equal his performance. And he did it a little bit slower as well last year. So that's good news. He's made improvement, but it is a big height event. You really have to be tall to to do well at the Fingal's Fingers. And once it's on the shoulder, that is usually the end of the game. You do sometimes see him give it a go from here, but every time he gives it a little push, it just gets harder and harder. You can't fault this fella's effort. Listen to these fans. They are loving it, willing him to do it. Can he do it? I think the clock's going to beat him. And the finger's beating him first. Well, he matches his performance from a year ago. And, but quite rightly, says thank you to these wonderful fans. A real tough competitor. And the second finger went over very smoothly. But the third one, again this year, just too much. Now, oh, Vitsis against uh, Dave Ostland. Both these fellas need to make a move with Hollands and Marunde in front of them. Remember, only the top two qualify. And these two fellas tied for third. There's, a, there's two battles going on here. One, they've each got to beat each other to maintain third place at the very least. But then they've also got to try and set some kind of tempo Take your position. to get something ahead of uh, Hollands or Marunde. So a very important heat, this. The American is the nearest to us. That extra height of his, you think, would give him an extra dimension here. And he's jumped out in front of Vidzis, who shortened squat and probably not physically well suited to this event. He seems to be coping so much better this year, Vidzis. Last year, he lost, believe it or not, nearly 10 kilos in body weight. Most of that through shredded nerves. But to be living with Dave Austin in the Fingal's fingers, He's doing very well because Ostland is a real master at this. Yeah, Vincis has got four and he'll be happy with that, but uh, Ostland has done the lot, as we expected, in a fast time. 
almost 39 dead. I think they've clocked him officially at 39.01. Now, is Vitsis going to get this finish? Well, it's on the shoulder, but look at that. What a big push. And he does it. Well, well, well. Now, Vitsis will be thinking to himself, if one of the big two stumble, I'm in. Well, Strongest Man, it's all about doing well in your bad events. Consistency and actually impressed me more there, Vitsis' attempt, than Austin's. So, Jesse Morunde and Terry Hollands know what they have to do. And Hollands has to get that little controversy out Take of his head in the, uh, in the deadlift and just focus on what he's got to do here. Because both those other fellas finished. These two must finish. 39-01 was Ostland's time. Marunde's attacking that, but Terry's not far behind him. Well, nobody was faster than Jesse Marunde last year in the World's Strongest Man final. Destroyed everybody by over three seconds. So this is good news for Hollands. He's almost neck and neck. 39-01 was the time to beat. And Marunde's going to have to go some to beat that. And Terry's certainly going to have to go some. Burundi's done it. Just. Hollands is not going to do it. So the challenge now for Hollands is to get that fifth finger turned to stay ahead of Vidzis. He's going to do it. So Terry, 47-73, the clock has stopped at. Good enough for third place, but it's Jesse that will finish top of the pile in the Fingles Fingers. Well, for Burundi, that was almost at a canter. Big Terry, though, really has improved his fitness, used his body weight well, and you're quite right. He got that deadlift problem out of his mind. Terry, you're second overall, third in that event. <laughs> How happy are you with that performance? Yeah, fairly happy. Um, after last year, I stopped at four, so I was quite. Pl I wanted to do the five, just sort of purely for personal reasons, as well as for points, obviously. Um, got to the fourth, realised I wasn't going to beat Dave. Knew I'd probably still beat Ravis, so just took it easy. Got the fourth and the fifth over. You're in a good position with two events to go. How confident are you moving forward? Um, yeah, pretty confident. I've got my two best events to come in the heat, so um, yeah, I'm fairly confident. Um, Farmers is without a doubt my best event. Should ideally win that. Um, and the barrel loading, I think I'll be pretty good at that too. Jesse, how much were you looking forward to this event, the fingers? Well, of all the prelim events, this is probably the one I was most confident in, and uh, I was able to nail the first that I that I needed coming into this event. I uh, was tied with Terry overall for first place in our heat, so uh, that, was a, that was a big win for me. That bumps me up uh, the valuable points that I needed. Now two events left to go. Uh, I'm optimistic about making the finals. Confidence from Marundi, but he only needs to look at how close Hollands came last year to realise that things can go awry. Dave Osland has done himself no harm with that second place, and Terry Hollands can be fairly satisfied with third spot. It keeps him safely in second place with his two favourite events to come. Marundi is sitting pretty at the top of the table. And this is a woman who shares the responsibility for Jesse's success, his wife Callie. Not only does she assist in his training and preparation, she also prepares the huge quantities of food a successful strongman needs. Every morning starts about 4.30, 5 o'clock. Uh, I make him his first shake of the day. He's off to his first training session. After that, he comes home. By that time, I've got his first pound of meat ready to go. And uh, as the day goes on, pretty much our lives revolve around training and eating and resting and then doing it again. So it's only fair that she should indulge in a little rest and relaxation while Jesse is away competing. Since his second place finish in the final last year, he and Callie have dedicated their lives to moving him up one spot on the podium. But in the heat of competition, the question always remains, will it be enough? We've done everything to prepare him for this competition. That, that we could possibly do. He hasn't missed a meal, he hasn't missed a training, he's been getting lots of rest and uh, been really smart about his training this time around. Hopefully uh, we'll come in, no injuries, and just do the best that he can do. If, if he comes in second again or even last, I'll tell you what, it's not for lack of effort.
A fitness professional in her own right, Callie has put her career aside to encourage Jesse loudly. And she has no regrets. I have the most fabulous life of anybody I know. I wouldn't trade it for the world. I get my workouts in, you know, when he gets done with his, because that's that's the main goal here is to for him to take home the championship. I think sometimes I want it for him more than he wants it. She really does mean business, doesn't she? The competition shifts now to Yalong Bay and the Mangrove Tree Resort, home to the athletes for the duration of the competition. It's the Farmer's Walk. Let's rejoin Nick and Colin. Thank you, Martin. Yeah, the Farmer's Walk, it's a killer. 75 seconds to complete a course of 35 metres, each anvil weighing 265 pounds, and both of them have got to cross that finish line. This is the event that drags the old arms out of the sockets. This is when you don't complain about dragging a couple of bags Take of shopping home after the end of a long working week because Ready. there is nothing quite like this event. It's an event you can start off feeling great and then suddenly it feels like your arms are going to explode. And so much of it is mental, just putting that out of your mind and uh, that's exactly what Marunde is doing here. Marunde coming first, he really has to produce a benchmark for the others, 16.88 seconds. That surely will be one of the fastest, but you never know because Morunda, he did stumble a little bit and I think he perhaps held back just a touch there. Not helped of course by going first. He just has to set a time and uh, see what the others do. I don't think he's going to be troubled by Goo. <sighs> right, let's see what the local man can come up with here. They will be ready to uh, raise the roof as uh, Goo eyes up this course. And it's not just a ready. straight walk, as we, we've seen from Jesse. Yeah. The, there's ramps they've got to negotiate just to build an extra dimension of pain for these fellas. These inclines really do change the muscle groups. It's more onto your hamstrings and bottom as you try and claw your way up them. And of course, you're changing surfaces as well, which can be a little disorientating from grass onto slicker plywood. I'll tell you something. This is better from Goo than any of us were expecting. Well, he's not going to beat the 16.88, but that's neither here nor there. Oh, I thought he was going to do it in one hit. Now, come on. You can do this. Don't give up that close to the finish line, and he won't. That is pretty good. No wonder he's going nuts. That's not shabby. Well, that gives China a whole lot to shout about. 35.55, considerably slower than Jesse Morundo, but I don't think anybody expected him for him to sprint past Jesse. I think he lost his own belief here. He saw the finish line, he thought, it can't be. And he started thinking about it, and then he just had to finish the job and the celebrations could begin. Take your grip. Vidsis needs points Ready. in this competition. In third place with only two to qualify. And he's seen both men fly. It's a... It's a good grip he's got. I'm talk, talk about flying. He's flying. 16.88 is the time to beat. He's almost broken into a run here. If he keeps this going, he's going to move past Marunde. And he has. That is phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal from the Latvian. <coughs> well, with a benchmark to chase, he didn't hang around, did he? He went for it. He went for the victory here. And I wonder whether Jesse Marunde going first has really punished him. Oh, Dave Ostland must have looked at Marundi's 16.88 and then Vidzis is 15.37. And Ready. when you're outside the top two, you've got to come up with something really special here. And again, this doesn't help the taller man. He's got the long legs, but those long arms as well, they drag and drag. He's going okay so far. One more round to go. He's going to be fast. No, he's not. He stumbled. He almost took top spot, but that little stumble cost him three tenths of a second and second place. Big goofy steps the whole way up and the weights were knocking against his knees. He managed to get up past the first ramp, no problem, but then there on the final ramp, it took its toll. Well, is it an Take advantage for Big Terry to go last, having seen three men really fly through this? He says it's his favourite event, he's talked it up, so Terry has talked the talk. Can he walk the farmer's walk? 
and he needs points out of this and so far it's positive good rhythm good technique in the first event he was lightning he really surprised Jesse Morunde in that cannonball carry and he surprised everyone again look at the speed he's absolutely obliterated Vitsis's time by a, almost a second and a half this is phenomenal from Terry it really is impressive stuff top points for Terry Hollands who's with Bill Kazmaier Terry, you said to me yesterday you were confident and looking forward to the farmer's walk. Are you happy with your performance? Um, yeah, fa fairly happy. Um, just had a bit of a stumble on the last ramp. It's nearly stumbled over the line, but apart from that, I think it's pretty smooth. One event to go. Last year, you were disappointed and didn't make it to the final. You're headed that way. Can you taste it? Um, yeah, I think I've got one foot in the final. As long as I make no mistakes, I'm there, so fingers crossed. Best of luck to you. Thanks very much. It doesn't appear that there'll be heartbreak this year then for Hollands. He predicted a win and he got one. The big news from this event though is Jesse Murundi getting only two points. That could come back to haunt him. Things are far from done and dusted for second place. Although Murundi must be a huge favourite to qualify, the Latvian Ravis Vidzis could still upset the form books. Now a top tip for you. If you don't happen to have a microscope handy and you want to find out whether you've got real pearls or fake, Here's how you do it. Real pearls, rub them together, you should feel friction, and you're left with a powdery residue. Fake pearls, on the other hand, rub those together, nice and smooth, but you're not left with anything other than a massive argument at Christmas when it's discovered that you've been a bit of a cheapskate. This helpful hint was brought to you by World's Strongest Man 2006. It's all still to play for in this second qualifying round. Find out who will join finalists Marius Pujanowski and Don Pope after the break as we go barrel loading. Welcome back to the second qualifying round of the World's Strongest Man 2006. We're in Sanya, the Hawaii of China, and with one event to go, things could hardly be tighter. Terry Hollands has all but guaranteed his place in the final, but one of this year's favourites for the title, Jesse Marundi, has a little bit of work to do yet. You've seen it before, three 220-pound barrels, that's 100 kilos, must be transported from one platform to another through water. Let's find out who'll make this year's final with your commentators Nick Halling and Colin Bryce. Yes, thanks Martin. Well, we knew that uh, Gu of China was never going to make the final. Two barrels in just under a minute. The other four will need to do better than that. And it's Vidsis and Ostland. Okay, take your positions. Ready. And in we go. Some guys swim, and as you see, Vidsis is going for the swim technique. And there's different techniques with the barrels. Some carried on their shoulder, like Ostland is doing now. Others try and use a little bit of uh, the water to take some of that weight. It's uh, whatever floats your boat, I suppose, that works. But two totally different techniques from these two fellas. I'm not sure which one's quicker because there's so much drag when you try and pull the barrel under the water. Dave Austin with those long legs runs out through this water. It seems to be a lot shallower for him at six foot six than it does for Vidzis at almost under six foot. Well, Vidzis is staying with the drag technique and Austin's now uh, employing that one as well. So a change from Austin, but he's trailing Vidzis. So it's unlikely that the big American is going to make the top two. Vidzis is trying to set some sort of target in the hope that uh, either Hollands or Marundi stumbles in this event. Well, in Heat 1, Harold Haugen was the only man to do three barrels, and it took him almost the full 1 minute 30 to do it. This could be incredible from Vizis. He's going to be under 115 if he attacks it here. And he needs to. He's got to win this event to stand any chance of qualifying. 1-11-79. Is that going to be enough for the Latvian? It's not going to be enough for Ostland. But Vidzis now can just sit there and watch as Jesse Morunde and Terry Hollands go to work. Oh. Oxygen. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that water cooled them off and as soon as they're out of it, the heat and the humidity just kills them all over again. Well, Ravis Vidzis has put himself in with a shout of making the final. A really brave effort from the Latvian. But if Terry Holland's here, or the fellow next to him, Jesse Morunde, 
get it in under 111.79. And then Vidzis will be out and both these fellas will be through. It's Morunde that's most vulnerable. The ideal scenario for uh, Vidzis is for Hollands to win and Morunde to struggle and for Hollands to come in at a lower time, or slower time should I say, than Vidzis. Cool. Watch out when those two big fellas hit the waves, you'll be uh, feeling the aftershocks back in Dartford from that one. It's very hard to see Jesse Morunde doing badly here. He was such a spectacular athlete in that barrel throwing event. He's so explosive. He's got that American football background. He's, well, the rugby player background is winning this one at the moment. Big Terry. Yeah, that's a bit of a turn up for the books because uh, Morundi made the faster start. And then he got overhauled by Terry. Remember, 111.79. That's the magic number. If Vidzis wins this, it could be the loser of this particular duel that fails to qualify. And I don't think they're going to beat 111. So it's now become a personal battle between these two to get second spot. Hollands looks exhausted. Morunde doesn't exactly look like he's uh, cooking with gas. But this is vital for both these men. Less than 10 seconds now. Vidzis surely is going to win this event. And Morunde has gone past Terry Hollands. In the last few seconds, this is absolutely vital. Hollands has got ahead again. Vidzis looks on. He doesn't even know what is going to happen. But I can tell you, you're in. Latvia will be there. Terry Hollands will be there. That was so close. What a finish. Terry Hollands has made it. Jesse Marunde is out. Well, it's heartbreaking stuff here for the American. Just a couple of feet away from making the final. Let's not forget, Marunde was second at World's Strongest Man last year, and now he's out in the heat. Jesse, I know you had really high hopes. The disappointment has just got to be incredible right now. Did I not make the finals? <sighs> nope. Oh, I've overcome a lot of adversity just to make it this far, so I'm pretty happy with myself. Just have to get back into training, make another comeback. When are you going to start your preparation for next year and how much are you going to do? Oh, it starts right now, man. Just like last year, as soon as I step off this field, preparation begins. Always focused. Well, you are a great competitor. We look forward to seeing you again next year. Right on. Well, extraordinary scenes at the end of one of the great qualifying rounds. Travis Vidzis can hardly hold back his emotions as he qualifies for his first final in the most dramatic of fashions. That victory provided him with the all-important five points he needed, and Terry Hollands did just enough. Had Marunde beaten the Englishman, we could have had a three-way tie at the top of the leaderboard, but as it is, the man from Kent has made up for the heartbreak of last year. He's dried off now, and he's talking to Martin Bayfield. Rugby to rugby! Well, Terry, when we came to the end there, the final reckoning, there was a few minutes of hesitation, a bit of doubt. Did you in your mind know that you were through or were you a bit worried? Um, yeah, I knew I was through. I wasn't sure if Jesse was through, who was going to go through, Ravis or Jesse. And, um, well, as it happens, Ravis has gone through. So, yeah, it was a bit of a surprise. I expected Jesse to go through, but it's just the way it goes, really. Well, big shock there at the end with Jesse not going through. Has that made an impact on you or are you just focusing on what you have to do yourself? Um, yeah, just finish the job now. Do my best right the way through to the end of the final. And, um, yeah, fingers crossed it can all work out OK. Impressive stuff from Hollands. Join us next time to discover two more men who'll join him in the final. Until then, goodbye. Next on five, celebs. From A-list to nobody, they've done some silly stuff. In the south coast. I'm here in beautiful Sanya, overlooking the crystal clear waters of the South China Sea. The temperature is a balmy 90 degrees, and amidst all this peace and quiet, it's time to see five guys go head to head to see who'll get through to the final of World's Strongest Man 2006. We're almost at the halfway stage in this grueling qualifying process. So far, four men have smashed their way into the 2006 final. And here
Heat 1, the reigning champion and odds-on favourite, Marius Putinovsky, barely broke sweat as he dominated proceedings. Don Pope accompanies the pole. The man from Ohio looking extremely determined to improve on his eighth place finish in last year's final. England's Terry Hollands was victorious in round two. Calm, confident and immensely strong, the man from Kent used his 30 stones to maximum effect. The biggest shock so far was the failure of Jesse Murundi, last year's runner-up, to qualify. Instead, a very emotional Ravis Vidzis sealed his place in the final in dramatic fashion. Six more places are up for grabs, and this program will reveal two more finalists. First up, the carry and drag. 75 seconds to carry a 220 pound cannon 20 meters, then drop it into a sled and then drag the cannonball and that sled back 20 meters. It really is a tough one, and the first guys to uh, attempt this challenge are a couple of little bulldogs. Elbrus Nigmatulin, Russia's strongest man, and our very own. Darren Sadler, the uh, pocket rocket, dazzling Darren from Borough Bridge. Yeah, it's been a while since uh, anyone from England's been in the final, and it'd be nice to, uh, to get there. It's a bit overwhelming being at uh, World Strong Con for the first time, but I'm here to do my best and, and try and uh, bite everyone's heels as much as I can. I want to you know, do some damage. The mental side of it is probably the most important. Um, there's a lot of big guys that, uh, that can't do it, you know, they think they can because they've got big muscles, but it doesn't just work like that. I feel I could surprise a few people this year. I am a bit smaller than everybody else, but uh, we all come in different shapes and sizes, and it's, it's not a size competition, it's a strength competition, so, you know, you, you uh, do the best with what you've got. Yes, Darren Sadler, living proof that size Take doesn't your matter. Positions. Oh, well, hello. Something fell off there. Oh, it was just the uh, the little supporting hoop there. And Sadler has uh, got the early lead. Only just, though. Here comes Nick Matulin, and they're neck and neck. If anything, it's the Russian that's got the momentum going. And Sadler's in a bit of trouble. But now he's picked up. Oh, look at those dancing feet from Darren Sadler. That initial inertia seemed to catch him by surprise. But now those toes are twinkling now. He's the Fred Astaire of Strongman, isn't he? Look at those moves. Now, all he's got to do is keep it going as Nick Matulin starts to fall apart. And he's got him. Yeah, terrific comeback after he nearly stumbled and stuttered as he pulled at that sled. I thought he was going to fall over at one point, but he hung on and clung on. And once those feet started dancing, Darren was rocking and rolling. He's now talking to Bill Kazmaier. Darren, you're the lightest man in the competition. Are you surprised by your performance? Well, I mean, it's the worst event for me. You know, Anything but last is a bonus to me on that because of my body weight. So, so far, so good. Just see what the other guys do with some really big, heavy guys, a lot of experience. So just keep my fingers crossed. You were really fast with the stone carrying down those 20 meters. Did the heavy cart after you loaded the stone surprise you as you tugged on it? Yeah, uh, I think the trick is that once you get it moving, keep it moving, keep the momentum. Uh, and I seem to be able to do that, so that's good. Well, that was a great race. Congratulations. Thanks very much. Cheers. All right, in heat two, Mark Felix flying under the flag of uh, Grenada, but these days making his home in Blackburn, Lancashire. Phil Fister, the fireman from Charleston, West Virginia, and a former world's strongest man, Yanni Vertinen. Mark Felix. Grenada. Phil Fister. USA. Yanni Vertinen. Finland. Well, Nick Matulin and uh, Sadler both finished the uh, course. And well, Mark Felix has certainly made a slow start, but it's not how you start, it's how you finish in this race. Vertinen and Fister neck and neck, but this is where the uh, strength may count on. Oh, he's in real trouble there, Felix. He stumbled, but so too is Fister. Fister's down, and it's Vertinen with that superior technique that is going to take this heat. The question is. Can Fister edge out Sadler? Felix is in all sorts of trouble. Outstanding display there from Burton, faster than Sadler. But Phil Fister just a little bit slower than the Briton. As for poor Mark Felix, he really hasn't found his rhythm at all. He didn't listen to Darren's advice. You've got to keep it moving. That's a real disappointment for Mark Felix. With only two to qualify, you can't afford a bad start. 
Here's where it all went wrong for Fister. That slip cost him third place. Sadler will be delighted to be second, but it's top points for Vertonen. Yanni, you were a champion six years ago. How much harder is it now to get up and try to make it to the finals and get to the top of the podium? It's, it's, I say it's very hard because I have a little bit problem my back and legs and fingers. And now I'm ready to fight and let's see what happens. We're looking forward to it. Thank you. Well, you got a feel for Phil Fister. How important might that little stumble prove to be? Vietnam riding high after the first event, but Darren Sadler has every right to be happy. At just 17 stones, it's an impressive achievement to be ahead of giants like Fister and Felix, even at this early stage. To see if Darren can maintain his challenge, join us after the break for the drama of Fingal's fingers and the classic test of strength that is the deadlift. Welcome back to Sanya. The beautiful Nan Shan Cultural Park is the venue for our second event, the car deadlift. Home to temples, monuments, and at 300 feet, the tallest Buddha statue in the world. So, the deadlift. How many times can you lift those two cars? Yanni Vertonen went first, and he achieved a pretty useful 11 reps. Anytime you get into double figures on this, you're doing pretty well. Those cars weigh 661 pounds. How many times can you lift them in 75 seconds? And not only do you have to lift them, you've got to hold that bar all the way down to the bottom. Here's the little bulldog from Russia, Elbrus Nigmatulin. Now, that squat body of his, you would think, He's so compact, he's so powerful, that he would Take your have a real good body size lift. for this event. Let's see. Good lift! Lift! Started out as an arm wrestler, good would lift. you believe, before he started getting lift. into uh, Strongman seriously. Good lift! Lift! Well, he might not have the muscles good bulging lift. like Marius Budzianowski, or even Darren Sadler good for that lift. matter, but... Lift. Don't be fooled, this man is a serious Go customer. You know when lift. someone wins the Russia's Strongest Man Go contest, lift. he's going to be lift. there or thereabouts. Like his technique, slow Go and lift. steady. So many of them lift. fly at the early lifts and then start running out of gas. Nigma Tulin through lift. nine now has basically not taken a breather. That was the first time he stopped. So he's into lift. double figures. He That's needs seven. 11 to tie Vertonen. But he won't want to hips, stop at 11. Hips. Good lift. Looking at him. Lift. Looking at the eyes. He's got two or three more in him. Good lift. 12 gives him lift. the lead. 10 seconds. But he's running out of time. Can he put another one in? Yeah. With tremendous support from these fans. Lift. 13 will do, I think, for Elbrus Nigmatulin, the new leader. All about tempo and rhythm there. He didn't go blasting out of the gates. He just took his time, paced himself, and we'll be happy with that. A very tough performance from a real tough guy. And you're absolutely right. Steady, firm, and managed to lock all his reps out. Now, having had a disaster in the uh, carry and drag, Mark Felix knows he's got to have a good deadlift. And size-wise, he's not well blessed for this event because he's very tall. So he's going to really have to get those limbs doing some work. Lift! But I think his Good one lift. benefit is he has very, very long Good arms. Lift. Very useful lift. when you're a plasterer Good and also lift. useful if you're lift. doing some deadlift. And a Good very lift. wide stance as well and lift. he's tearing Good through lift. here. Too quick. Yeah, he Down. went too fast. Lift. Oh, it's all been going wrong here Good for uh, Mark Felix. But he's got to lift. put that out of his mind and just Good carry lift. on. Well, he's lift. claimed in England for some Go time lift. now that he's the best deadlifter lift. in the British Isles. And let's not forget, Pudzianowski 17 in Heat 1 Go is what he's chasing lift. if he wants to lay claim to best Go in the lift. world. Yeah, he's lift. got to think maximum points here. He's got to Go get lift. past 13. He's lift. flying. He really is. And it's good to Go see lift. that little uh, stumble lift. earlier. Hasn't hurt him at all. 13. Go this lift. ties. Nigma Tulin, anything else now is a bonus. He goes into the lead. He's still got time for two or three more here if he goes for it. Lift. Well, as you say, Pudzianowski, 17. Lift. Surely Felix can't match that. Good lift. He can. That's impressive. From last to first in two events, Mark Felix. 
Well, he says it's his favourite event. He just showed us why. If you were to look at a textbook of how to deadlift, this isn't how to do it. Wide stance, wide hands, but just so much power. Mark, you did 17 reps. You made it look really easy, was it? Yeah, it's it's not too hard. It's, it's not as heavy as, I mean, I usually do. You didn't get credit for one rep. What happened there? I think I was a bit too fast. You know, but I didn't let that put me off. I just composed myself and I just go for it. You look really good. Congratulations. Thanks. Here comes Phil Fister from West Virginia. Third place after the uh, carry and drag. Should have been second. He can't afford another stumble here. Once upon a time, this very confident American said he would be the world's strongest man. Is this going to be his year? Fast start, but he's seen what Felix has done, 17. I don't think Vista can think realistically about going for that. No, no, he's taken a bounce. He's tried to use the bounce, and the officials were all over that. He tried to cheat an extra lift there by using the momentum, and it wasn't going to happen for him. These referees don't miss a trick, do they? Well, Phil's laid claim to the fact that one day he will definitely win World's Strongest Man. He said that for nearly 10 years now. Time's running out, so Fister, he's a man who's really on a mission. This has to be his year. He can't have too many more in him. Well, he's not going to beat uh, Felix. Can he get to Nigma Tulin's 13? He gets to uh, Burton and 11. Two more to get to Nigma Tulin, and he needs the points, and he's not going to get there. He's going to have to settle for joint third with uh, still Sadler to come. Well, I'm not so sure about winning World's Strongest Man at the moment. He's just got to get through his heat. And this deadlifting performance isn't what he wanted. He's a tall man, but unlike Felix, he doesn't have the lower back power that he can bully it up. Darren Sadler surpassed expectations in that first event. He said he wanted to avoid fifth, that's where Mark Felix was, but Felix is uh, top gun in the deadlift so far. And nobody, not even Darren Sadler, is expecting uh, Sadler to challenge that mammoth score of 17. Now will he go for pace and tempo and just pace himself through this event? Looking good so far, but remember, the worst score in this is 11. 12 will keep Sadler in very good shape. If he can get to 13, he'll be in terrific shape. And so far, so good. Slightly losing form there. You can see from the side, his back bending. He's struggling to get his hips through. Good lift. He needs two more. Can he find them? Good lift. Now, 10 is not enough. He's got to find one more. Good lift. That's an important lift. This could be even more important. This could put him into sole possession of third place. Good lift. Tremendous stuff from Sadler. Finished. Yeah. He knew exactly what he had to get. He had to get 12 to push two guys below him. And he's done just that. I think that's a very professional performance. A wise head on young shoulders. Absolutely right. He was never going to beat Mark Felix. Felix set the bar very high with 17 reps. But uh, Darren will certainly be happy with 12. Darren, 12 reps. Could yeah. you get any more out of there? Honestly, probably not, because it's so hot out here. It was heavy, obviously. Um, 11 was fairly easy, but then the last one was very hard. But anyway, to get it, because there's two more guys that are high place that got 11. Uh, so 12 was the main marker to get in front of them with the points. But uh, I must say the last one was a real struggle, but uh, it's paid off and got me two or three more points. So probably worth it in the end. Impressive stuff from the grenade and blowing away the rest of the field. Felix lives with his wife and three children in Blackburn, so will no doubt have many supporters in Britain cheering him on. Darren Sadler is in a comfortable position after two events, the smallest man in the competition, more than holding his own. Phil Fister's hopes of becoming world's strongest man, looking in some doubt at the moment, though. Nanshan is 40 miles to the southwest of the athletes' base in Sanya and is one of the most important religious, cultural and environmental centres on Hainan Island. Guanyin Temple houses the world's largest gold statue of the Buddha.
People can make offerings to Guan Yin and have their names inscribed on miniature golden Buddhas, which are then left in the temple. The larger the gift, the more auspicious the location for your statue. A gift of 150 RMB, approximately 10 pounds, gets you a spot near the door. Prices increase right up to 60,000 RMB or 2,000 pounds for a position in the main golden Buddha enclosure. As yet, none of the athletes have been seen making deals with the deity, but there's plenty of time left. Now Mark Felix is probably feeling suitably enlightened after his performance in the deadlift. Can he continue that good form into the Fingal's Fingers, which takes place just over there? Well, this is a tough event at the best of times, the Fingal's Fingers. You've got to tip those five fingers through their axis as fast as you can. And the lightest one weighs 440 pounds. And you've got 75 seconds to do it in. Bad enough at the best of times, but in this heat, and in particular this humidity, it's a draining event. And Mark Felix has drawn the short straw here. He gets Take to go position. it alone, so he's got nobody working alongside him. And it's a very technical event. You've got to keep momentum. You don't really want to be resting those fingers on your shoulder at any point. It's about arm strength, but it's about pumping those legs as well. All four limbs have got to work together. Absolutely right. You've got to try and lock your arm at the same time as drive through with your leg. You have to use your most powerful muscles, and that comes, of course, from your quadriceps. And this is one of the problems he's had in the past. He slightly attacks this with bent arms, and you lose some of the energy. Yes, those elbows are not locking, but it's sheer force of will and arm strength that's pushed that fourth finger over. But he's going to need better technique, surely, for the big one. This is the fifth finger, and he's slowing the intensity, those eyes burning into the finger. But he's slowing and slowing, and once, if it drops onto the shoulder, you might as well forget it. And I think, yeah, there it goes. He's struggling. He might as well put that down. That is not going to turn from there. As soon as it hits the shoulder, unless it's really at the point of tipping, it just doesn't seconds. go. And it doesn't matter if it's 15 minutes, Mark Felix is not going to turn that fifth finger. Well, this is a very quick way to injure your shoulder. He's got to be careful here. He's fatigued, he's tired, he should just give this up. Well, he was reluctant to do so. He's a competitor, but four fingers in 37.37. Wow, well, big arm strength. Absolutely right, Nick, but that isn't the way to get five over. The fifth one, you really need to get the rhythm correct. So, heat number two, it's Nick Matulin. The pint-sized Russian against the other little man in the competition, Darren Sadler who has probably surprised himself to be in the lead after two events. Take it's consistency rather than greatness that's got him there. He's had two very useful events. Hasn't taken maximum points in either. Let's see what he can do here. The little fellas, Colin, do they, are they at a disadvantage in the fingers? Well, I was just thinking that. This will test our theory about short men struggling in the fingers' fingers. There's no doubt about it. If you were to speak to a physicist, they would say that a taller man has a much better degree and angle to push on this. But these two guys, they don't care about physics. Yeah, this is finger four, which uh, Felix did in 37.37. Nigma Tulin has beaten that. So has uh, Sadler. So they pushed Felix down into last place. The question is, can either of them take this fifth finger? Nigma Tulin has done it at 44.29 and Sadler wasn't far behind him again this is a really consistent performance from Darren Sadler 45.59 he was just 1.3 seconds behind this man here that's impressive it just shows you how people can overcome certain physical problems with just sheer determination just a few years ago only a couple of men could do five Here's a man who would expect to do five. The world's strongest man of 2000, Jan Nevertenen. And a man who says one day he's going to be the world's strongest man. Phil Pfister. 
in last place Great after two position. events, and they've been two sloppy events as well. The American can do better and must do better. Can he make his charge here on the Fingal's fingers? Well, he's certainly made a fast start. Two down, three down. He's flying. 44.29 to beat. Well, he's doing this in just four hand plans. That's incredible. I've never seen anyone just manhandle these Fingal's fingers like Phil Fister. And the fifth one, it's going to go just as easily. <laughs> yeah. 32.44. Now, it's going to be interesting to see what Vertanen can do. Can he beat the 44.29? Yes, he can. Vertanen takes second. And you have to feel for Darren Sadler here, 45.59. And that's only going to be good enough for fourth. And I suppose we have to say it. That is the fastest time ever on the Fingal's fingers. Phil Fister recovering from that poor deadlift very well. Yes, this will kickstart his campaign. Phil, you find yourself in fourth place uh, coming into this event. You know, we're not even halfway through this group, so who cares? It, it, what matters is the end of the group. I'm just practicing up for the final, just warming up. You know, God willing, I'll be there and have a hell of a height on my hands, you know? How easy did you find this event? You know, I've always been pretty cool, calm, and collective about Strongman, but damn, I'm anxious this year, you know? So, the war's going on up here right now. A supreme effort from Phil Fister seems to have won the battle for now. Unsurprisingly, the tallest men excelled in the fingers. The biggest shock must be Mark Felix's poor showing. With just three and a half points separating the five athletes, this one is much too tight to call. Darren Sadler has slipped to third, but Harrogate's Pitbull loves a challenge. It's the halfway stage in round three, and things couldn't be tighter. With three events left, any two from five could make the final. After the break, it's an all-time classic World's Strongest Man event. We're heading to the idyllic Yalong Bay for the car walk. Qualifying group so far this year. Finland's Jani Vertanen leads the charge for top spot, but all of the five competitors are within striking distance of a qualification place. We're back at the Yalong Bay Resort for the grueling car walk. This is a horrible event at the best of times. But when you've got to move this car up a slight hill as well, it becomes particularly brutal. The legs start to get very heavy, and as we've seen in the past, the worst thing you can do is actually put that car down and rest, because when you go to pick it up, because you've got that slight incline, you sometimes start going backwards and lose yardage. Felix needs to get rhythm and momentum. That's the only way you get this 900-pound car moving at all. Absolutely right. You need to do fast steps as well. Steps that are too big and you'll overbalance and stumble. Then, of course, you have to pick it back up again. So very much like Fred Flintstone. Fast, quick feet. This is steady stuff, but he's drifting. Drifting very erratically here, Felix. Now he's steady the ship. Mark, of course, needs a big one after the disappointment of the fingers. He's, he's been an all-or-nothing guy, hasn't he, Felix? He's had two last places and a first place. And this is good stuff. Very good stuff. 34.91. There's not many will finish this course. Well, is it another from zero to hero for Mark Felix, I wonder? No doubt about it. Felix has colossal raw power. He still hasn't managed to get his techniques correct in some of the events, but when it comes to just a pure strength event like this, he's doing very well. Hidden under that towel is Phil Fister, and you need that towel when the heat and the humidity are going off the scale as they are here in Sanya. It's a beautiful place, but not a place where you want to be exerting yourself too much. What can Fister do? Well, straight away you can see there's a balance problem. That car's listing badly, and that's not going to help the cause when it... I think it's because he's kind of pushing it up. He's not helping himself at all. His technique's all over the place here. Well, this is very disappointing for Phil. This is one of the events in the final. And at the moment, I don't think he's going to make it into the final. He was one of the favourites coming into this heat. 
and indeed into the whole competition. There you go, he's almost staggering backwards again. He's not got the balance point right at all. Some of the others, they're putting their hands out the window, and I think that could help pull the car in a bit. He's, he's, he's got a decent distance. He should score reasonably well. Three seconds to go. And he may yet complete the course. He's not allowed to push it. He can't do that, Phil. He's got to get some elevation now. I think he's... Seconds. I think... <laughs> no. Sometimes these fellas, they just know when they've given it all. And Phil had given it all 20 metres 80. Mister hasn't quite shown us the ability that he's shown on the international scene over the last couple of years. Nerves. I'm not sure what it is. So, the former arm wrestler will now tackle a 900-pound car. Ready! He looks more and more like that, uh, that James Bond character, doesn't he? Odd job. The more you see of him. But, uh, not so fast, Mr. Bond. I'm carrying a 900-pound car here, is probably what he's thinking to himself. Good steady technique. Remember, he needs to beat 34.91 to take top spot, or he needs to get past the 20.8 meters that Fister achieved. This is unspectacular, but it's working for him. Now, this is the interesting moment, though. When you lift and start again, can you keep your momentum going? Do you lose something? His feet are very wide there, just trying to squat this up. And he pulls them back in to try and walk forward, but the wobbling begins again, and, well, he's shaken and stirred, this man. 10 seconds. He probably wishes there was an ejector seat in that car right now, because that's the only way out of his nightmare, that or that final whistle. Well, 16.6. He's disgusted with himself. That stumble in the middle when he went down didn't help his cause at all. I think he was doing everything right, small, short steps, but then the back of the car just caught the grass, and that sent him off balance. Vertanen will give it a go. They're enjoying it. Well. Look how wide he starts off with. That's very interesting. Getting a real wide stance to get some good elevation there. That car is looking very steady at the moment. Good time. Now, if he can keep this going, he should be good for maximum points. That's easier said than done. But he is absolutely tearing this course up. And Mark Felix is in a little bit of trouble here. That 34-9-1 might get erased right here by Vertanen. Sensational. Absolutely magnificent from Yanni Vertanen. And I like the way he went for a really deep squat. Got it very high, just as you were saying. Huge elevation. And that meant as the car rocked around, it didn't clip the grass and drag him down. Wise, wise decision that. Yeah, I think experience came to the fore here. <laughs> and now it's Darren Sadler. Well... We saw what happened to one little man, Elbrus Nigbatulin, 16.6. Currently in last place. Is that an omen here for Darren? 23.43 is the time to beat, and I think we can safely say from those first two footsteps that's not going to happen right here. But how much can he get out of this course? His first target is to get past 16.6. Uh, he's such a gutsy competitor. So often you see other competitors when they when they get to that position that the car's down, they just know that that's enough. This has this man has no quit in him at all. The clearance nowhere near as good as Yanni Vertanen's, but that at least allows him to pick the car up each time. That little bit easier, and he's having to. He's picked it up four or five times now. But he's he can't beat Felix, and he's already passed yeah. Phil Fister. This is you, you hate to be critical. This is wasted effort. But I guess when you're just a true competitor, like Darren Sadler, you just want to beat the course. And that's exactly what he's done. And for a young man in his first World's Strongest Man competition, that's big bragging rights.
Sadler's efforts earn him third spot in the car walk. Phil Fister again disappointing in fourth, but a scorching time from Vertinen gets him all five points. The Yorkshireman is still punching above his weight in second place, proving that technique and attitude are every bit as important as bulk here in Sanya. But can anybody catch Yanni Vertinen? Another question is, has that effort from Sadler taken too much out of him? Should he have stopped once he was past Fister's distance, as he had little chance of beating Mark Felix's time? Only time will tell. The car dropped three times, and it takes an awful lot to get it up and going again. But this guy will never stop trying. Darren, you were really struggling at the end. How are you feeling now? Just tired, exhausted, you know, with the heating. You know, a lot of pressure as well, I suppose. Down into the sea now for a bit of relaxation? Definitely, yeah, definitely. You deserve it. Thanks. Let's hope the sea can rejuvenate the Englishman because his lack of size is really going to count in the next event. Next up is the Farmer's Walk. Well, the Farmer's Walk is a cruel enough discipline anyway, but some sadist around here decided to put ramps into the uh, runway as well. So you've got 35 metres effectively uphill carrying two anvils, each weighing 265 pounds. That's bad enough on a level playing field, but with these ramps built in, well, it's almost cruelty. Yanni Vertinen has the disadvantage of going first. Take your grip! I say disadvantage because everybody else will know what they've got to beat. So the strong man of 2000, the world's strongest man, makes a nice positive... Oh, hello, that's not very good. Now, what happened there? Uh, he, is he limping? Okay. He's, he's not happy. This doesn't look too good at all. And, and he's really tightening up. Well, at, at first I thought he just lost the grip, but no, there's a serious problem here. And he's gone for ice immediately. What on earth happened here? Well, I think as he went up the first incline, he just pulled a muscle in his calf. Another step. And he's just been around the scene so long, he knows when his body is damaged. He's gone for the ice, who knows, perhaps he can battle on. Well, the look on his face there suggested he's in trouble, and the look on this man's face just suggested, what on earth am I doing here? Darren Sadler. Take your grip! In the farmer's walk. He's picking up good points in every discipline. Ready? He's being very consistent. Is it going to be enough to get him into the top two places here and qualification for the final? A fast time in this farmer's walk, as we've seen in previous heats, is 15 seconds or below. What can Darren come up with here? Well, he's not going to... it's not bad. 16.16 is not bad. It, it, sets, it sets a target for the others, but that's a target they may want to have a shot at. I think Darren really gave a lot in the car walk. Probably lost a bit of power in his legs, but I think it's a time that he'll be reasonably happy with. Darren, is that going to be enough? Not ideal, I don't think so, no. Uh, really tough to guys to come. Uh, it was as fast as I could go, so it's enough for me, but I think, I think it's beatable. What did you find the hardest? The weight in your hands or hitting the ramps? Just the ramps are a bit strange, it's a bit different, you know. You know, it's not, you don't turn up ramps, but uh, that's what it's about, make it a bit different and test people's strength. When you hit your stride on the ramps, do you think your height hurts you, some of the taller guys? Yeah, but legs out as long, so, you know, slow me down a bit more, but it's no excuses, it's, uh, you know, it all's fair. Well, it's the turn now of uh, Elvis Nigmatulin, who needs a big farmer's Take walk. He's languishing in fifth. He's capable of much better than that. 16.16 is his target. He's made a fast start. Can he keep it going? Remember, sub-15 is very achievable on this course. He's making these ramps look ridiculous. Oh, and there's a stumble. That could be expensive. But still, he comes in in 15.29. That shows you what it is possible to do on this course. He would have got under in around 13 if he hadn't stumbled there. Incredible performance from Nick Matulin. What a tough character. Well, Mark Felix is just yo-yoing up and down the uh, leaderboard at the moment. He either seems to uh, blitz these events, 
or completely stinks them up. Ready. What do we get here? Which extreme from Mark Felix this time? Hello, that's unsteady legs. That, he's wobbling around like a, like a fellow who's had too many at the bar. But he's kept it together. And he's got one more ramp to go. And he has beaten 15 seconds. I thought he was in real trouble. But 14.83 puts him in the lead. One of the secrets of this event is you have to try and push the weights away from your leg. And the weights just kicked into his knees there at the start. Nearly stumbled, but was lucky. So, 14.83 is the target for the American, Phil Fister. I've been doing strong mate eight years, and it's both very rewarding and very punishing. And every year I keep getting stronger and staying healthy, so I, I'm still here, I'm still trying to make my mark. Kind of a humble representative of the U.S. in a lot of ways. I haven't slept uh, real well for the last month because I'm so focused and so intent on bringing the biggest fight of my life here to China. As a professional firefighter, I'm very fortunate to have a lot of time to pursue um, more than just a single career and be a professional strongman as well as be a good family man and spend, spend a lot of time with my son and my wife. I know that regardless of the outcome of any contest, I'll always be one of the strongest guys to ever walk the planet. Well, Fister's big strength is his grip. This is a grip event. Mark Felix knows that better than anybody. Will his 14.83 stand up? Fister on a good run is capable of taking it. Big strides as well from the American, but controlled strides. The grip's certainly not a problem. He's keeping that rhythm and routine, and this 14.83 is looking vulnerable, very vulnerable. Can he take this last one? Oh, he's done it by three tenths of a second. And look at this, a little bit of showing off for the crowd. The grip there, <laughs> so easy for him. And here's a little fact for you. Phil Fister can fit a quarter through his wedding ring. Big hands from Fister. And a big time as well. Maximum points. After a disappointing performance with the car, you blistered this course and won by three tenths of a second. Tell us about it. You know, the car was uh, something I was really amped up for. I've been really amped and psyched for this whole qualifying course, and it's, it's been uh, I've been a little too overexcited, you know, and and you really have to be meticulous and calculating, and almost a little conservative. So I tried to go back to that on this and be smooth and quick rather than just wide open. Well, tell me what kind of statement that was at the end, holding on as if you had no weight in your hands. Well, Billy, you know how brutal this sport is. I mean, we saw Yanni rip his calf, but this, this was a drag race and uh, not a true test of grip for some of the strongest grips in the world, which we have here. He needed the win and he got it. Impressive stuff from Phil Fister, but the cruelest of blows for Yanni Vietnam. The final was beckoning, now his place in it looks in serious jeopardy. Despite his lofty position on the leaderboard, that injury may have threatened his challenge, but with just three and a half points separating first and last place, this is going to come down to the wire. Two spots in the final up for grabs, one event left. There's high drama after the break. Welcome back to the tightest finale of a world's strongest man heat we've had in many years. And we've moved to the Yalong Bay Golf Club for barrel loading. Now the rules of this one are pretty simple. There's a 90 second time limit. You've got three barrels each weighing 220 pounds. And it's just how many you can load in how fast a time. Well, Nick Matulin managed to pick up all three barrels, but he knew that his destiny was out of his hands, whatever he did here. He enjoyed cooling off though in this heat and this humidity. And he just came in inside the 90 seconds. But with one event to go, Phil Fister suddenly emerges as the favourite because Vertanen is struggling with that calf injury. He will compete here, but this man in third place knows that he can steal second and book himself a place in the final of the World's Strongest Man. And Darren Sadler, fourth place after five events. It's been a terrific performance from him. Is it going to be good enough? Well, whoever wins here 
If the time is fast enough, they might have a shot because it's such a tight race. Let's see what technique they use with the uh, kegs. Some guys put them on the shoulder, others use a little bit of water to get some buoyancy. And they're both going for the buoyancy routine here. Good start from Sadler. He's got to get the place with that. Oh no, he's lost the barrel. Oh, that could be expensive. That's cost him three, four, five seconds. And it's given Felix a little bit of breathing room here. Five seconds for losing the barrel. I wonder how costly that might be for Sadler, but he's starting to make it up. This guy's starting to feel it a little bit. You can always see it in the eyes when they're struggling. Well, he's gone crazy. He's really attacking here. He's almost going to catch Felix within a barrel. But how expensive has that been? The lactic acid pumping through Sadler's body now. 125 was Nick Matulin's time. They've got to get past that. Felix is really starting to struggle. And Sadler has caught him up. Now, who can have the sprint for the finish line? 125 is their target. They got 20 seconds to beat Nick Matulin and go into first place. And remember, he lost nearly five seconds, Sadler. Oh, and another horrible moment for Sadler, just as he thought he was there. And he, oh, both of them have given everything. It just shows how cruel this event can be. And who's going to nick it? Well, Nick Matulin is going to be top dog. And in the end, neither of them have managed to complete the course. That is cruel. They both died and collapsed at the finish line. I'm completely exhausted watching this and of course that means Felix wins now by virtue of his second barrel. Sadler just one turn away potentially from making the final. Mark, how confident are you that that time will hold in performance and you'll make it to the final? I don't know. We have, I think we have to wait to, to see what they're going to do because it's a very difficult day for all of us. So, let's wait and see. Well, if they dished out awards for bravery, this man will be in first place. He carries on despite that calf injury. Fister, in joint first, should be okay here. All they've got to do is beat Mark Felix. Ready? Now, all eyes really on Vertonen. It's not about Fister this. Fister should get this job done. What can Vertonen do on one leg? Well, I guess he's going to try and swim as much as he can, but he can't do that now. Now he's holding the barrel. And I had a look at it on the physio table. It's black and blue, his calf. Fister's made light work at the first barrel. So too is Vertonen. This is a tremendous effort from Vertonen. It's all on the second barrel for, uh, for Yanni. If he can get this second barrel down in a faster time than Felix, he'll be through. And of course, if he gets the third barrel, then he's definitely through. Fister looks like he's paced himself perfectly. What an effort this is from Vertinen. Struggling. Okay. That second barrel is now on. Well, I don't think it was faster than Felix's. And that will mean that Vertinen now has to do this third one. And just over 25 seconds to go. And he is running out of time. Fister, he's definitely through because his second barrel was faster than his opponent's here. So Fister is in. That settles that. But the interesting one is here. Vertinen running out of time. Eight seconds left. Eight seconds between Vertinen and a place in the final. And he's running out of time. Is Felix going to do it? Is Vertinen going to do it? Oh, oh, that is so cruel. He was within a fraction of a second of the final. Fister got there. No problems for the American, but you have to feel for Yanni Vertinen. What does it mean to be back in the final? You know, it's, it's a lot of pressure that I put on myself. I'm not ready to leave this sport yet. I still feel like I'm getting stronger, I'm getting better, and I'm still trying to make my mark. I still got something to prove. So I'm looking forward to a good fight in the final. Well done. Thanks, guys. Phil Fister did exactly what was needed and Yanni Vertinen was just seconds away from doing the same. Elbrus Nigmatulin claimed second place, but Mark Felix's third position proved crucial. Dropping that first barrel proved Darren Sadler's undoing. Even if he'd managed to stand the third one up, it would have been after Nigmatulin's time and too little to get second place.
Well, Darren, bit of disappointment. One slip of the barrel away from getting through to the final. You must be very disappointed. Yeah, pretty much so. But I've done my best, and uh, these mistakes happen. And there's good guys out there, and if you make mistakes, they, you know, they catch up with you. Simple as that. Do you think you've learned anything from this tournament, your first foray into world strongman? Yeah, I've learned that I can, I can certainly um, sort of run with the guys, um, that I can uh, keep up with them. So maybe next year I can come back a bit better and maybe a bit more luck and, and try and get through to the final. Well, we all seem to share in your agony when that barrel went over. Well done for pushing it so far and we'll see you next year and better luck. Thanks. One of the toughest competitors we've had in many years, but in the end it all came down to standing a barrel the right way up. Darren Sadler misses out. Instead, Mark Felix accompanies Phil Fister to the final. Bitter disappointment then for Darren as Harrogate's gutsy David just fails to overcome the mighty Goliaths of the strongman world. But with valuable experience under his belt, he's sure to be back next year with a bang. Two groups to go. To find out who gets through from them, join us next time. Until then, though, it's goodbye from Sanya. And next time is tomorrow night at 8. Next tonight, the explosive series finale to CSI Miami. Unfinished business for Horatio and 10 grand up for grabs. So don't go away. So, six guys are through to the final of this year's World's Strongest Man. There are just four spots left. So while I relax with a nice round of golf, it's time to let battle commence again. I've taken a break from the power drinks to come and check out the magnificent facilities here at the Yalong Bay Golf Course in Sanya. Calm, serene, a place where impeccable breeding comes to the fore. The perfect venue then for World's Strongest Man 2006. Four more final places are up for grabs. This program will decide two of them. First up, the carry and drag. Yes, the athletes have 75 seconds to carry a 220-pound cannon 20 meters, then drop it into a sled, then drag that cannonball and sled back 20 meters. Dagmar Mitt, Estonia. Boris Haraldsson, Iceland. Jarek Dimek, Poland. Dominic Filiu, Canada. Kevin Nee, USA. And the first heat of this uh, carry and drag is the United States against Estonia. Kevin Nee against Tarmo Meet. Two very experienced campaigners. It's amazing that uh, we talk of Kevin Nee as an experienced campaigner considering his youth. He's still at uh, college at Arizona State, but uh, he's been around a little he's been around the block a little bit now. And uh, he's got to do a bit of chasing here because Meet has made the fast start, but uh, Nee's caught him up and this is where this thing's won and lost and it's lost badly by Nee. How important could that stumble be? The Estonian is still going. The, the ring that supports those balls, I think, got carried with him. And I've got a feeling he might have tumbled on that ring, you know. Oh, that is cruel luck for Kevin Nee. I think you're absolutely right there, Nick. That's terrible luck. 26.15, however, for Tarmo Mitt is really world class. Right. I'll make it up. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Well, he's got some making up to do. Yeah, there is that ring, and that's what caused the slip. I don't think he did stumble on the ring, but I saw the ring was out there. In fact, it got caught up under the sled. And that's what caused him to stumble. That sled did not run true. So the first two have gone. And the remaining three now step up. Boris Haraldsson, the popular Icelander. Only five foot ten. 
This fella's not five foot ten. One of the big fellas, Dominic Filiou. They call him the house, but in French speaking, Quebec, of course, it's Le Maison. And uh, this is interesting, Yarek Dimek, the pole, the second best pole behind Marius Pujanovski. That could make him the second best, strongest man, athlete Take in the world. But positions. Dimek is struggling with flu. He's been playing it down a little bit, but he's definitely not 100%. Although you wouldn't know it the way he started out. Oh, now he's slowed down. Yeah, he's in, oh, and he's collapsed. Well, he put everything into that initial burst, and that flu has clearly caught him. That is not what you expect from Dimmick, and I don't think these two fellows can quite believe it. The big man, Filiou, getting the job done. Harrelson's plodding along, but all eyes, really, on Dimmick. He talked about flu, he went off fast, but he hit zero very quickly. And I think Filiou is looking around as if to say, well, what happened there? Harrelson's in his own little world, just trying to finish this. Well, if you imagine, the average person has to take on five to ten liters of water in these kind of hot conditions how about a giant man with flu who knows how much water Yarek Dimmick's lost over the last couple of days and well just complete exhaustion and here he goes just collapses couldn't even see what he was doing and well he's lucky not to get injured well his future hangs in the balance but our winner now is talking to Bill Kazmaier no no I puke for the night Tarmo you're a pretty big guy how does this event suit you? Uh, I'm normally doing this very well and I, I was very hoping that this time also I'm getting good result and I succeed. When Jarek went down and had a problem, what were you thinking about that? This is very terrible, it's so, something like this happens and I'm very hoping that it's not going to happen with me. Good luck to you. Thank you. A great start for the man from Estonia. Tamo Meat finished sixth in last year's final. Dominic Filiu is well placed at this early stage. The Canadian giant is the heaviest he's ever been. Third. I would have won it overall. The unhappiest man, though, has to be Kevin Nee. Five more minutes. I would have won it, though. Oh, my God. Right. With five strength sapping events ah. ahead of us, things are only going to get more intense. It's time to get your trunks on after the break. We're heading to the beach for the keg toss. Welcome back to Sanya, where the temperature is 95 degrees and the humidity around 85%. Now we've seen the athletes struggling a little bit in these conditions, so I'm not taking any chances. Lee here tells me the 16th is an absolute beauty. At least I think that's what he said. Anyway, let's get back to the action and rejoin our commentary team. And you rejoin us for the keg toss. 10 barrels, each weighing 30 kilograms, or 60 pounds. And the wall height, 14 foot six. Not sure what that is in uh, meters. I do know this, the most kegs over the wall in the fastest time is a winner. What I don't know, though, is what kind of state this fella's in. Yarek Dimmick, suffering with flu, literally collapsed in his first event. He needs a huge score here, and, and they better move those spectators back if Dimmick's in this mood. That first barrel went very close to the spectators. There is some pent-up frustration going here. 14 foot 6, they might as well make it 16 foot. He's clearing it by miles. Yarek Dimmick, undoubtedly one of the most gymnastic strongmen there's ever been. This is a man who has well over 20 stone, can do a backflip. And he's really attacking this. 14 foot 6, it's even taller than Martin Bayfield. Steady, not that tall. Well, I think the fastest we've seen in any of the heats was 50 seconds. Dimmick's not going to quite crack that, but he's got a chance of getting it in around a minute. And none of those eight barrels have touched the tin. That one did. The first one to make any kind of contact, but nine down. 30 seconds. All ten gone in one minute and three seconds. Well, it might have been a false start, but he's up and running now, and that has sent a warning out to the other four men in this field. Dimmick's okay. So explosive. Wonderful to see him make a comeback like this, and who knows? He could go from last in the first event to first in this with that performance. That's going to take some uh, stopping. Here's the big man. Dominic Filiou, six foot five. 
That's his height. His width's not much Ready. shorter. <whistles> now, does that extra size give him an advantage? Now, he's going for a different technique. He's taking one barrel at a time and again. I tell you, those spectators better have their eyes wide open. They're enjoying it. But it's a very technical event as well. It's not just about throwing those kegs high up in the air. You've got to get them over that tin as well. You don't want them coming back down on the same side as well. So there's a lot more to it than just a swing and hope. He's actually clearing it so high. It's a bit like Dimmick. I mean, that's going way over. Well, you wonder how much energy he's expelled by attacking it so hard early on. Feliu didn't practice this much coming into this. He has really gambled on the fact he's so tall. And there you go, another one, three or four foot over. Surprised he's taking one keg at a time. I I'm sure if he just grabbed one with each hand, he'd, he'd shave a few seconds off this. He's not going to beat go. the 103 of Dimmick. And I think that could have been on for him, but he's certainly taking his time to make sure of each barrel. But this, as you say, with a bit of practice, I think Filiu could tear this apart. I mean, he's going to finish with around 116, 117. He could shave 15 seconds off that without any effort at all. Well, you know, one of the reasons he didn't do so many practice throws is really he's actually a very shy man, Filiu, and with all the others like Pujanovsky shoving in, practicing away, it was very hard for him to get enough practice attempts, but, well, he certainly proved to be a great barrel thrower here. 117. Clearing all 10 is a major achievement. <coughs> Dimmick has done it in 103. Now Filiu has followed suit. The winner of the first event, Tamo Meet. Ready! is up next and he goes for the two barrels it's got to sh save you a bit of time just taking two barrels off the stand and he only just cleared with that one though that one was a little bit better and he's gone back to one at a time that's interesting all clearing so far we've seen so many barrels in previous heats they're smacking into the tin and coming back down but this field making absolute mincemeat of this 14 foot 6 wall Tom has really taken a gamble in the last couple of years. He was a computer programmer in Estonia, and then he decided to really bulk up and go for the world's strongest man. Finished, made it into the final last year. And again, he needs to put in a big performance. And he's he going to live off of his strongman money. He needs to look at the clock. 103 is the time to beat. He's got a chance, but he needs to move fast. And maybe he snatched at it too quickly. Maybe he saw that 103 and thought, I've got to get rid of it. And he's messed it up. Now 117 is the second target. Well, I just wonder, 109, that's not shabby. In fact, that's very impressive. But he could have taken that. And I wonder if he just snatched at that last keg and it's cost him a place. Well, he got the last one over fairly easy, but the one before that, that was the real problem. Uh, Tom Omit completes all ten. Well, it comes to something that Kevin Nee is coming up, having seen all his rivals Ready? clear all ten, all in pretty decent time as well. Dominic Filio at 117 is actually third out of three at the moment. Nee only just did enough with that first barrel. The second one's gone as well. He's nippy, very quick on his feet. Now... <laughs> Did you see he covered his head there as he, as he hit the tin? You do actually have to watch for this in all seriousness. If that barrel comes down and you haven't moved, you could be in trouble. I tell you, the uh, scorekeeper might be in trouble here. We could have our first sub one minute clearance. And he's doing just enough. All of them skimming over. No, that one doesn't skim over. Now, was that... The energy level starting to go, or did he just misjudge it? It will... No, he's in trouble. Well, to look at him, you think he's incredibly fit, but I think he's made uh, a couple of mistakes in his preparation. He's doing a lot of talking, expending a huge amount of nervous energy. He is a young man when really he should have been hiding in the shade, drinking water, and uh, perhaps the occasion will get to him here. Oh, that is going to cost him... Everything here, I don't think he's going to complete the course. 
He still had a shot at uh, beating Filius 117 if that one had cleared. Ten seconds. And there is so much heat and humidity here. That ninth barrel could yet be a, a important. Can he get it over in time? No, he can't. He settles for nine barrels, Kevin Nee. The heat and the humidity really got to him there. I thought he was treading a fine line with the early ones because they were only just clearing and very often you see the later ones, they, the, the, the height starts to drop a little bit and that's exactly what happened to Kevin Nee. Boris Harrelson up next, the latest in a long line of Icelandic strongmen. I was probably around uh, 13 or 14 years old when John Paul won World Songs Man the first time. That's when I started dreaming that I wanted to be World Songs Man someday. I think every Icelandic boy has dreamt about being World Songs Man because of John Paul. I am the mighty. When John Paul beat Jeff Capes in the arm wrestling, he actually injured Jeff Capes. And when he beat him, he turned to the crowd and said, The king has lost his crown. The king has lost his crown! He was like the greatest showman I've ever saw. I kind of have to maintain the legacy. Hello! That's how you do, people! <laughs> <laughs> Never a dull moment when Boris is around. Just takes a look at that 14 foot 6, a final glance just to see what he's got to achieve here. We've seen some of these barrels sailing way over the uh, the top and threatening the spectators. Well, something they've really embraced in Iceland is the whole Highland Games culture from Scotland. Boris, we first saw over in Britain a few years ago, was a Highland Games thrower where they do a very similar event. And, well, you can see he's a, a very skilled thrower. And he's doing the smart thing technique-wise, taking two barrels at a time. And he's cleared six in sub-30. There's a real chance of cracking. Oh, hang on, that seventh one uh, just about stumbled and wobbled over. But he's got a chance still at uh, 60 seconds if these two clear. 1.03 is Dimmock's time. That still stands as the lead. But that 1.03 is now at a threat. He's picked it up as if it's empty. And he's cleared it. 51.16 by any standard that is a phenomenal time and he hasn't even broken into a sweat well truly incredible and considering the heat this man's from Iceland you don't get 38 degree days there do you of course you made those look so easy did you go up there knowing you'd be the fastest no I went out there knowing that if, the, if I had to throw more than 10 kegs I'd, I'd get out of breath and lose, so I just try to make everyone count every throw. Well, great job. Thanks, man. Yeah! Quite a performance from Boris Harrelson, one of the shortest men in the group having no trouble getting those 10 barrels over that 14-foot bar. He'll be much happier looking at that table. Estonia's Tamo Mitt still leads the way, but it's all extremely tight at the moment. The competition moves away from Sanya for the next two events as the world's strongest man, Rocho, travels to the Nanshan Cultural Park. It's time for Buddhist serenity to come face to face with strongman intensity. Well, next up, the deadlift. You need not only a very good grip, you need to be able to use those quads and your lower back as well. Dominique Filiu, a tall man will always struggle with the deadlift and feel you would have been very disappointed with just seven. Haroldson, well he got into double figures but that's a beatable target as well. Mark Felix in his heat managed 17, a score that was matched by Marius Pudzianowski, so that's uh, what's achievable here, and it gives you an indication of uh, what's on the line here for Mitt, 10 is the target to beat, that's a very beatable score, and Tamo Mitt will be looking at this saying, well I can pick up some good points here, steady start, some guys fly out of there like a greyhound being let out of the trap, others just take it steady and try and pace themselves, and he's going for the latter option. Well, just a couple of years ago, Tom Omit was a terrible deadlifter. Amazing how much he's worked at it. Now, he's looking at getting, well, double figures potentially here. Well, that's a bonus lift. Anything else now is uh, 
guaranteeing him third place at the very least. And you've got to hang on to that thing all the way down, otherwise it will not count. You can't drop that bar. Good lift! 12. Will do it. And that's not bad for Tom O'Meat. When you consider that on paper one of his weaker events, he'll be very happy with that. He's blown away Filiu and Haroldson. <laughs> and his technique of the double overhand grip. Quite unusual. It comes from his Olympic lifting background from Estonia. Here's Jarek Dimmick trying to still recover from that collapse in the first event. Much better with the barrels. Second place, he was pipped at the post. He, he, he needs to think first or second from every event from here on in to have any chance. 12 is his target. And with one more athlete to come after him, he can't just relax at 13. He's got to push it and push it. He needs maximum points. Wow, this is amazing how easy it is. Zero expression on his face there, just breathing in, breathing out. His back like a brick, absolutely solid, no bend whatsoever. How do you recover from collapsing to looking so strong and so composed? He's been taking a lot of water on board. That's helped him. Yeah, he takes the lead. But how many more will he put on? He's looking tired now. Very often the pause. Oh, I'm not sure he's going to get this. It's a struggle. He's not going to make it. And I, I think that'll be it. And he's done the right thing bailing out here. <laughs> there's there's no, really no point in pushing this too far. No, absolutely right there. That was an outstanding performance. Considering just a, a matter of t hours before he was collapsed on the floor and well here he is now putting out a huge performance in the deadlift almost as good as his compatriot Pudzianowski the best in the world on 17 alongside Felix. Kevin Nee, big Boston Red Sox fan hence the B tattooed on the uh, on the deltoid there. He has the distinct advantage of going last in this one and it is an advantage because you know what you have to beat. Take your position. Lift. But if Kevin Nee gets 15, lift. there will be amazement around Good here. Lift. Lift. But after the problems he's had, he's got to cut, he's got to put in a performance right Good here. Lift. Lift. Well, he's done a lot of power lift. lifting, Kevin Nee. Lift. Squat, Good not lift. so good at. Lift. But this, the deadlift, good amazingly, lift. at his lift. young age, he is very good. good it's lift. normally something lift. you improve a great deal with as you get older. Lift. He's really good zipping lift. along here. He's in the double figures very fast. Now, has he put in too much too soon? Good He'd like another lift. one just to get joint second. This could be important. Look at those veins bulging. He's got to 12, so he's in joint second. He needs two more to join Dimmick. But he just never gives up, Kevin. He, he's really hit the wall here, though, just like he did in the barrel throwing. Good lift. Oh, the pressure there on his body as he's yanking it up 14. Well, that'll give him a, a share of maximum points. He didn't even attempt yes! to go for 15 because he put everything into it. He could have taken a point off Dimmick had he gone for another one and got it. But they'll both be happy enough just to settle for 14 and a share of the spoils. Well, he looks totally exhausted and, and almost a slightly pleased look from Dimmick because Dimmick knows he took away a little energy from this event. But Kevin Nee left everything on the battlefield. Kevin, you're paying the price to go into that zone. Yeah. Just describe that feeling. Well, I mean, I've had some pretty poor performances so far this competition, and I knew I needed to get at least 14 to show what I can do, and man, did I, I really had to struggle for those last two, but it's the world's strongest man. You can't hold back. You can never hold back. I mean, I trained for this year long. I eat, sleep, think strong man and if I make it here I got to give it my all either either that or I don't deserve to be here well you're deserving and people back in America are really proud of what you, the effort that you put out keep it up I hope you're okay thank you so much I appreciate the kiss thank you that superhuman effort from Kevin Nee gets him a valuable joint top spot how much will pay for that amount of exertion though only time will tell Yerick Dimmick is making good ground after that scare in heat one
At the top of the leaderboard, Tom Omit is still looking extremely strong. But even after three events, it's still anyone's competition. We're at the halfway stage and it's time to take a break from all the pushing, pulling, lifting and grimacing. After the break, some of the world's strongest men will be trying their muscular arms at golf. our cars stay glued to the road. The Saab 9.3 Sport Wagon. Saab, move your mind. The bigger the challenge, the more you need Duracell. Down go the ordinary zinc carbon batteries, victims of exhaustion. Down they go, up he goes. When endurance matters, we can all count on Duracell. Duracell lasts longer, much longer. Not one. Welcome back to Sanya, the Hawaii of China, and the perfect holiday destination for a new generation of Chinese entrepreneurs. As well as beautiful beaches and five-star hotels, its golf course is one of the finest in the world. So we're better for three of our strongmen to learn the finer points of one of the world's oldest sports. Relax. Yeah, I'm fine. Relax. relax, please. I'm too much to relax. 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 Take call and then I will. Oh, <laughs> I think I tore my puck on that one. Kevin has improved a lot as a golfer, but he can never fully become a good golfer until he stops thinking about his hairdo and his calves. Look, look, he's the best in the golf. And the strong man is like, you know. <laughs> Boris is just jealous that. You know, people come up to me and tell me how good looking I am. All <laughs> you know, they talk about how big his head is, but, so it's, <laughs> you know, it's all right. I, I deal with it. Oh, yeah. Maybe I should take up golf. To find out if all that swinging has had any impact, it's time to head back to the Mangrove Tree Resort for the Farmer's Walk. It's not the walk that hurts these guys. 35 meters with uh, two anvils weighing 265 pounds. That's bad enough. It's the fact they've got to go up ramps that really, really makes these men suffer. Take your grip! A benchmark in previous heats has been 15 seconds. Go sub 15, you've got a good time. Anything over that, and you're probably not going to be getting too many points. There's the first ramp negotiated. It is cruel. We've heard all the competitors talk about it. Those ramps, they don't like them. But Harrelson's doing okay. Not the quickest time in the world. Now, he's going to finish, and he's going to take 17.7. Okay, but very, very beatable. 17.7. I think your first assessment of the times was absolutely right, Nick. 17.7. It's going to be right out of the game once the others have done it. So take your grip, then you go down. I'll say ready. You can Dimmick has players. jumped from last to okay, second in the space of two events. If he stays there, he'll qualify for the final. Only the top two will progress. And Dimmick will certainly want to go sub-15. Hey, that right-hand angle's wobbling around a little bit. The anvil swung, and that can get into the knee if he's not careful, but he's got away with it. He's putting in a quick time here. Just slowed a little bit on that ramp. Definitely starting to slow here, but getting in at 16.53. That's not fast, not by his standards. But I guess when you're suffering with flu like he is, you'll take anything you can get. Doesn't look happy. Well, at least he goes into the lead. That's the most important thing. Who cares about the times? Yarek Dimmick comes back from being on the floor in the first event to once again in the lead. 
Well, of course, these times are all relative. If you're in with four other guys who can't beat you, you're going to get top points. 16.53 wouldn't have been good enough for third place Ready. in the last uh, heat. Here, so far, it's in the lead. Unless Dominic Filiu can do something about this. So much raw power in this man. Six foot five and shredding this course. He's definitely going to have a shot at the 15 seconds here. Doesn't quite make it. Just dropped outside. Slowed. 16.01. Still good enough for the lead. He's like a giant 18-wheeler, Filiu. Laden, unladen. Didn't matter that this man had so much weight in his hands. He spinned up that hill like it was nothing. We haven't seen the real Dominic Filiu up until now. Is that the house, Dominic, and his power? Uh, no, it's, a, it's not a very heavy uh, event. It's more a speed event. I prefer uh, heavier events uh, like uh, the squat stuff. Did you surprise yourself with your performance in this event? I was uh, very surprised. I was worried to uh, lose my grip. What are your chances to get into the final now? Uh, I guess it's pretty good if I continue uh, getting into the top. But uh, anything can happen because it's very close. Well, here's Kevin Nee. We know he can hit a golf ball. Ah! He's got a good set of lungs as well. Last year, being here my first year and only being 20 years old was just amazing. I never thought that I would make it to the big show so young. I'm a very emotional person, I guess you'd say, and, and you can see it when I compete. I definitely feed off the audience. The more they're screaming, the more they're fired up, the more I get fired up. And I'm not doing it to showboat, it's just when I've finished a, a lift, I get so intense. I gotta let it go and it's just a great feeling. I have fun with it. Well, some very pedestrian on, scores. So far, 16.01 is the target. It's not Take a bad set grip. of scores, but uh, you might have expected more from this field. Who's going to grab hold of it and really rip it up and go sub-15? Well, not me, the way he started off here. A little stutter steps, little pigeon toes there. But now he's getting it together. Now he's starting to motor. And he's finishing stronger than he started. And now he's slowing down a touch. Oh, that was a nasty stumble. 17.09 will knock him down to third. No, he didn't need that. Sorry, sorry. No, he's disappointed and frustrated. You beat me. I got 17.09. 17. It's all right, it's all right. Dave Olsen just cheering him on there. All of these young Americans really sticking up for each other. They practiced so much, but they didn't practice these ramps. No one did. Well, the man in the lead gets the advantage of going last here, and he'll have looked Take at uh, the other four, and have, I'm sure he's thinking to himself, well, what's the problem here? In earlier heats, 15 seconds was getting cracked routinely. Ready? Here, no one's cracked 16. Can Mitt do something? Having said that, everybody's much of a muchness. There's no room for a stumble. If you stumble, you're going to come in last here. And he did wobble on that ramp. But here he is, he's going. Sounds like an express train coming at you, doesn't he? Look at that. Finally, somebody does it. 14.82. Tarmo Mitt cements his position at the top of the leaderboard with 14.82. Well, the organizers tested this a few times and they thought this was going to be extremely hard. I think next year we're going to need a couple more ramps. After that performance and with a look at your position, you're a certainty for the final. Yeah, my position went better and I feel in the moment very sure myself. But still, two, two heavy events to go and I will do my best to reach the final. For your size, you move incredibly quickly. Was that your plan? That's my plan. I trained that. And actually, I even lost my weight, especially to move faster. If Tom Meat can maintain anything like the form he's shown up to now, he looks untouchable at the top. But there was an important four points for Filiu, and the giant Canadian is right back in it here in Sanya. The Estonian may be all but through to the final, but with just two events remaining, 
Anyone from four could claim that all-important second qualifying spot. Welcome back to the beautiful Yalong Bay Golf Course here in Sanya on China's southernmost tip. I wouldn't have thought the pros who play here make as hard work of it as I seem to be. Still, time to get on with some real hard work. The athletes have arrived at the golf complex and things couldn't be tighter in group four. Two rounds left, first up, the overhead stone lift. Well, I think Martin should stick to rugby balls rather than golf balls. But moving swiftly on, four stones crafted by a stonemason in Finland and transported over here. The lightest of them, 227, the heaviest, 294 pounds. 90 seconds to lift the most stones. Well, Kevin Nee looked to be going home, really, after this problem. He had to lock those arms, and he's been flat all events. Jarek Dimmick, who's been moving pretty well, managed one. But this irregular shaped second one was too much for him. So one stone for Dimmick. <laughs> Tamo Mitt looks to have uh, locked this heat up. He's been storming through effortlessly. The only real question is who is going into the final alongside the Estonian. We, it won't be Kevin Nee, we know that. But who will? be taking second place. 227 is the first target. Yes, a good lift called. And that right there is enough surely to give Mitt enough points to confirm that he'll be finishing in the top two. Well, the hockey puck shape first one fairly easy for all the competitors, but this second one is just two pounds heavier. But because the weight's so high, it's very awkward to press. And Tom Mitt needs to lock his arms. Now he didn't get it there. And uh, as we've seen before, he's lucky not to get a headache if it slips out. You saw him looking towards the referee, almost in desperation, trying to kid him. I have got it, I have got it. And then he heard those two words that he dreaded. No lift. 90 seconds is the time limit, so he's got plenty of time to go for the second stone. And he will push it as well here, Mitt. I suspect if he gets the second, no, he's not going to do it. Did they give him good lift? I think they did. But he's only got to lock his arms for a split second. They're being very generous in the refereeing of this. No one wants to see the stone being held up there too long. There is a certain danger element in this, which is why we're all sitting here grimacing away. Now this stone, a much better shape to press. No lift. No, he doesn't get it though. And a wry smile. That's the end of that. But it's not the end of his campaign. This fella can start planning for the final. Two stones in uh, more or less a minute dead. It's such an awkward shape, this second stone, isn't it? It really has uh, confounded a lot of these lifters. Well, there's another three stones back in the yard, and this is an event for the final, so who knows? Maybe we won't see that second stone in the final. Bottom of the pile after four events. Boris Harrelson knows Ready. this has got to be win or bust. Win or pack it in. Win or go home. Any cliche you like to take. It's going to be the end of the road if he doesn't get them. So his target is that third stone. Actually, even here with this second stone inside a minute, he'll be okay. Good lift. That'll do it. Simple as that. So Harrelson can pack it in right here, but is he trying to send a little message here, or is he just wasting some effort? Well, I think this is really quite clever, actually. It's good to practice on these stones. He's assuming he's going to make the final, and quite right, too. You've got to be full of confidence in this kind of event. You've got to attack everything with uh, absolutely full steam. This is a heaviest stone, but it's a generous shape. It's a shape that these fellas can get their hands around and just give it a lift. And he's still got another 30 seconds to play with here as well. And I, th I think you're absolutely right, Colin. He's just... Uh, testing himself for a possible shot at the final here Good and if he does get to that final he will fancy that event that's how you do it people well there you go <laughs> that's a good training session for you isn't it full of confidence full of gusto and full of power is boris harrelson boris in testing you dropped one of these stones on your head will you tell us about it yeah it was pretty heavy 
So I was trying to break it so I wouldn't have to do it in the qualifiers. But the stone was harder than I thought. So, but I did it anyway. Well, how did that affect your confidence coming into this? It didn't. I'm very cocky. But, you know, in Iceland, there's a tradition of lifting overhead stones. So, you know, I've done this quite a few times with even worse shaped stones than this. So, I was pretty confident. Well, just how tough was it? It was very tough, heavy stones. Last one especially, when you lean back, it puts a huge pressure on your chest, so you can only inhale like a quarter of, the, of your lungs. So, it was tough. Well, I think all the other competitors have watched Dominic Filiu during practice for this event and thought, well, nothing to worry about here because poor old Dominic was all over the place and the look on his face suggests a man who just doesn't want to be there at Ready? all. Frankly, on his form in training, it'll be a miracle if he manages one stone. Well, he's just so big. Believe it or not, these big stones really quite small to him. It's very hard for him to get his hands and wrists underneath them. He just can't get any purchase on it at all, can he? He can't risk if he takes his hands away because he's got it's the balance issue. He just can't get it up high enough on that barrel chest of his. And as soon as he moves his hands, the stone starts to slip and he starts to panic. You can almost see him snatching at it. If he gets to that position, he's okay, but it's getting there that's the problem for him. And this second stone, this irregular shape, well, I'll buy Martin Bayfield dinner if he makes this. You certainly wouldn't back him now, would you? Oh, and he's going for the uh, round shape on his chest. Some of the others have gone for the flat he, shape, and I think he's, I think he's he out does, of puff. He doesn't know what to do. He's going to, to put it on his side now and see if that'll work. Yeah, it's right that way. Uh, no, it's... It, I, I can't see how he's going to do this. He wants to kick it, doesn't he? Finished? Yeah, he doesn't want to know. Well, one stone had to do. He had no desire to be anywhere near those stones whatsoever. You saw it in his face before he even got there. Well, you can see, once he actually got it up above his head, his tricep power is enormous. This man can press weights, just not these stones. Haraldson, the only one to lift all four stones then. That Icelandic power and experience, more than enough to blow away the other competitors. Tom Omit picked up the all-important four points he needed. That confirms that Estonia's strongest man has reached his second successive final. And cocky or not, Boris Haraldson has given himself a great chance of joining him with that masterclass of stone lifting. It looks to be between the Icelander and Jarek Dimek for that second qualifying position. So one man has made it through, but who will join him from Group 4? A dramatic barrel loading head-to-head -head will reveal all after the break. Well, that mix of Chinese and Polish takes us nicely to our final event, and the uh, race for second spot couldn't be much closer. The man with nothing to worry about is Tom Omit. He's safely through. Kevin Knee's out of it. Dominic Filiu has a slim but unrealistic chance. Realistically, it's down to Jarek Dimmick and Boris Harrelson. Whoever can win the barrel loading out of those two will go through to the World's Strongest Man final. 90 seconds to move those three barrels from the pontoons in the water to dry land. It's been a surprise how disappointing Kevin Nee has been. Tom O'Meat can uh, take this event off if he fancies it, but uh, that's not in the world's strongest man lexicon. Dominique Filiu just needs to win and hope for miracles, and I think uh, Filiu knows that's not going to happen. Really, all interest and all eyes will be on our next event here, and these two fellas can just take their time and take it easy. Wonder which technique they'll use, Colin, because we've seen some guys go for the over-the-shoulder technique, others use the water just to help buoy those 220-pound barrels, and they're both going for the, uh, the buoyed-up version. Well, I think the water level's raised by about a foot there. The water displacement <laughs> from, from Shamu, big Dominic Filiu, is terrifying. <laughs> Over 200 kilos and 30 stone. And it's going to be interesting to see how he deals with his soft sand. You know his physical condition is not going to be as good as some of the other slimmer, more svelte men, but he's still going. Well, nobody's uh, in any great hurry here. Tom Omid, of course, is just... Uh it's just a practice run for him. 
he's safely there. Phil, you would have thought would have had a more of a sense of urgency here. He does have a slim chance, but uh, realistically, of course, it's not going to happen for him. Well, sometimes you just like to shake Filiu a little bit. He's not very aggressive, is he? Despite his uh, enormous frame and look at the size of his arms. Bigger than most people's legs. He's not the sort of fellow you'd want to get angry, though, is he? Let's face it. I mean, who's going to light a fire under Dominic Filiu unless they're a safe distance away? But it, it, it's almost like watching something in slow motion here, isn't it? I mean, Mitt, you can understand Mitt. I mean, what does he have to prove here? But uh, where's the urgency here? <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah, well, he can smile. He can start planning for the final. But uh, Filiu showing no urgency whatsoever. Just couldn't get rid of that third barrel quick enough. Leaves it in the water. Some poor fool's got to go in and fish that out. 59-39 is time for two barrels. It puts him in the lead. But he probably won't be staying there. And uh, he just looks unhappy all round. Well, I'm quite certain that's uh, not a big enough benchmark because uh, Harrelson and Dimmick are going to come out on fire now. And the equation is absolutely simple for these two men. The winner will advance to the final of the world's strongest man. If Harrelson's feeling nervous and edgy, he's not showing it. Obviously, they've got to beat Filiu. But uh, I guess maybe it's wrong to assume that they're going to get the uh, three barrels, but... Uh, I think this is going to be very intense. They know they're racing each other. And uh, Dimmick is going for the old over-the-shoulder number. Well, he suffered that horrendous biceps injury last year in the World's Strongest Man final. He was really nervous about carrying the barrel the way that Boris is. And I guess that's why he's employing this technique. Harrelson caught up an awful lot of time there, though, as um, Dimmick had trouble getting it off his shoulder and onto the podium. That allowed Harrelson to take to make up all that time. And now they're very close, but it'll be interesting to see if Harrelson catches up once again when the pole gets to the podium. This is where it all went wrong for him last time. Now he's worked it out a bit better, and he's got a good lead, and he's looking good. Well, if neither of them do the third barrel, Dimmick's won it now. He's gone so fast on that second barrel, but he's employing dangerous technique here because this could slip off his shoulder. We've seen it before. There's 30 seconds left, and Harrelson has to fly. He's got to get that third barrel on that podium before Dimmick, and it doesn't look like it's going to happen. Dimmick's grip looks good. A glance around at where Harrelson is, and he is closing in on a place in the final. But for a man who collapsed in the first event, that is some comeback. It would have been a shock if Dimmick hadn't been in the final. He's got through. And wonderful, wonderful comradeship and spirit between all these competitors, including these two, that really were battling it out head for head. Yarek Dimmick, the only man to complete all three barrels, just forces out Iceland's Boris Harrelson then. After collapsing in the first event, qualification is an impressive achievement by the pole. Yarek, considering the start you had in the first event, how proud are you to make it to the final? I have big, big pressure and I put all on the one card and only one, I only one walk it this bars on the shoulder, I think. If this work, I win. If not, I lost. I put all on the one card. Do you have anything left for the final? I have time to the rest. I have time to the, uh, recover my body. And I will be much more easy in final. Best of luck to you. Thank you very much. Confirmation then of Jarek Dimmick's fifth appearance in a World's Strongest Man final. Tom Amit wins the group by half a point, but made sure he saves some energy. He'll be back to 100% for the final. So. Poland triumph yet again as Jarek Dimmick overcomes a decidedly dodgy start to qualifying. Tomo Meat also appears to be in outstanding form. We've had four qualifying rounds so far, just two final spaces are up for grabs. To find out who gets them, join me next time. But until then, it's goodbye from China. And that battle continues tomorrow at 8 here on 5. Next tonight, a millionaire turns to the media in a desperate attempt to see the return of his kidnapped son. Mel Gibson stars in tonight's movie, Ransom, after a 5 News update.
Welcome to the final qualifying round of this year's World's Strongest Man. We've seen eight giants smash their way into the 2006 final. There have been a few surprises along the way and we've had our fair share of blood, sweat and tears. Now though it's time to find out who has what it takes to earn their place in the upper echelons of one of the most brutal sports around. Six men, one aim. Join these guys in the final of World's Strongest Man 2006. Poland's Jarek Dimek, Grenada's Mark Felix, USA's Dom Pope, England's Terry Hollands, the favourite Marius Putinowski, the mighty Estonian Tamo Mitt, the USA's Phil Fister and the little Latvian Ravis Vidzis. Two from five, it's anyone's game. And it's not an easy opening for these fellas, the medley. A 40 metre course, they've got 75 seconds to carry a 220 pound cannonball halfway and then a pair of 265 pound anvils back again. Let's meet the five men looking to do just that. Magnus Simonson, Sweden. Odd Haugen, Norway. Sebastian Venta. Josh Thickpin, USA. Sławek Toczek, Poland. And first up, it's Poland versus Norway. Slavek Toczek. The Polish number three up against uh, Odd Haugen. Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> and if you think he looks a little bit uh, old to be doing all this, you're right. But uh, age has never been a barrier for Odd Haugen. 56 years old now. He was Mr. Norway in 1968 before most of these other competitors were even born. Well, age is uh, withering here in the heat of this attack from Tojcik. It's Tojcik that's made the fast start, very fast, and Haugen needs to uh, turn on the afterburners here. Here comes the anvils, a stumble here could make it interesting, but Tojcik doesn't look like he's going to stumble. A little wobble, but I think he's got away with it. Meanwhile, Tojcik tearing it up, Haugen's definitely stumbling, but he's kept himself together, and the grand old man of strongman finishes in 35.89. Well, we've already seen Marius Pudzianowski and Jarek Dimmick, the two seasoned poles, going through to the final. And Slavomir Tojcik, with that effort, has already gone halfway to booking himself in. But Odd Haugen, really one of the wonders of the modern world, isn't he? 56 years old. He truly is one of a kind. Now, Sebastian Venter. Just pleased to be here, I think. Not many expected him to be at this stage. Magnus Samuelsson, you've got to go back to 1998 oh! to remember when yeah. he won the World's Strongest Man. But any time you're a former winner of this event, you've got maximum respect. And oh. from Pasadena, Texas, representing the Stars and Stripes, Josh Thigpen. Take your positions! <laughs> and off they go, and it's the... Uh, Swede, Samuelson, that's off to the flyer. Samuelson's carrying a bad back injury leading into this. He hurt himself a couple of months ago and he's had his own private chiropractor flown out here to help him. But watch out for Venter in the orange, former shot put champion of Poland. Samuelson's in a bit of trouble here. He's keeping it together. No, he's not. He's down and, and Thigpen's seen that and he stumbled too and Venter's coming and stolen it. Well, well, well. Samuelson's finished, but he looks hurt. And Thigpen. Yeah! Well, that's a surprise. That's a turn up for the books. But what happened here with Samuelson and Thigpen? Well, is it the back? Whatever. Venter couldn't care less. Consistency has got him top marks. Some distress for Josh Thigpen, but even more problems for Magnus Samuelson. Magnus, 11 years, you were champion in 98. Is it just catching up with you? Maybe, I've been suffering from injuries the whole summer and maybe I should have walked away from this contest, but uh, I feel like I owe it to my fans and family to give it a shot. Just what's wrong with you? It's a disc uh, between 7th and 8th that's 
damaged and uh, for some reason he came back again this time and squeezed the nerves really hard and that's why he saw me drop the weight. I, the big Swede don't drop light weights like this normally. Bad news for Magnus Samuelsson then, but a decent result from the first event considering that injury. Sebastian Venter and his fellow Pole Slavic Tojcik are leading the way for Eastern Europe at this early stage. Magnus Samuelsson's back will be put under further intense strain after the break as the athletes do battle in one of the classic strength tests. Coming up, it's the deadlift. Golden Globe nominee Forrest Whitaker in one of the great... Welcome back to World's Strongest Man 2006. Now I've heard that Chinese herbal teas have powerful medical properties. And if I did have any designs on competing in this competition next year, I'd need all the help I could get. The perfect way to while away the hours and avoid the hot Sanya sun. I'll enjoy the local brew and leave the hard work to the athletes and our commentary team. Yes, no change there then, eh, Martin? But you're not going to be the only one sitting out the deadlift. Magnus Samuelson is out as well. He explains why to Bill Kazmaier. Magnus, you got banged up in the first event. You want to tell us your status right now? The status is that uh, in first event, uh, I took up an old injury that happened to me two months ago. I've been suffering hard from that during the, uh, the preparation for this contest. Even though I, f I felt great yesterday, I felt stronger than ever. And um, the disc bulked out again. It's a bulking disc I have. And this event attacked exactly that uh, area. So I decided to skip this one out and uh, then uh, give it my best go on the other events instead. Well, that's going to be zero points in this event. Do you think you can lose that and still make it to the final and make it up? It's going to be a hard race, but uh, even though I would love to go out and deadlift right now, it's just not meant for me to, to, to be this time. I'm pretty badly injured and uh, I just have to gamble a bit and see if, see if I can do the other events good. And Maybe if I have a little bit of luck with the, how the other guys places and so on, it's still possible. Well, that's a real shame that we won't be seeing Magnus in the deadlift for which there is a 75 second time limit to lift two cars weighing 661 pounds. The most reps means the most points. Sebastian Venter, the shot put man, is first out of the blocks. Well, he's very tall, he's very rangy. That's not necessarily an advantage. Take your position. You need a good grip and you need plenty of power in those quads Wait. and in the lower back. Good lift. 10 would be a kind of average Lift. benchmark. If you can Lift. get into the teens, you've got a chance of Good getting Lift. some decent points. Lift. Well, he's using Good a Lift. strange angle, isn't he? His Lift. feet right forward. Good these Lift. poles put a lot of thought Lift. into these events. No doubt Marius and Yarek and, of course, Sebastian Lift. and Slavomir have built something like this Good back Lift. in Poland. Lift. Yeah, and they're very much a team, aren't they? It is Team Polska when it comes to strongman. Well, he's got there with number eight, but that wasn't encouraging. Now, as I say, ten is very ordinary, and he's not even there yet. He's struggling at nine, and he says, well, that's going to have to do, but that's not a great tally. Well, with Magnus Samuelsson out, and a couple other tall men in this heat, Josh Thigpen, Odd Haugen, this might not be such a bad score. Next up, Josh Thigpen didn't make the final last year. I wonder how he fancies his prospects this time around. In Strongman, I honestly think that the mental part is more important than the physical part. Well, you have to be tough, you have to be a warrior in this sport. You take a mental beating, so if the guys that can maintain that, uh, the mental part is what's going to separate the best. My intensity can become a disadvantage. If it consumes me and I don't you turn it into a positive, for instance, just if I let it get me down, that's when it turns into a bad thing. Uh, but hopefully I can channel that this year. Last year, I think that I overlooked the qualifier a little bit, and I just focused on you know, how much I wanted to do well in the final. But you, know, you have to make it to the final first. So this year, I'm going to take it one event at a time and not look ahead to the next event and do as much as I can, go 100% all out on that event right then and there. Because actually, it was in 1982 that Kaz last won. Uh, so that was the year I was born. So since I've been alive, there hasn't been an American win World's Strongest Man, and that, that eats at me every day. USA! 
There's a lot of guys coming up. We're all very strong, uh, but somebody's going to have to step up and win it. It's instead of talking about it, it's getting pretty old now. So uh, we want an American to win it. Doesn't matter who it is. If it's me, that's awesome. Or anybody else, well, that that'll be awesome too. Well, I wonder how realistic a contender he is. If he is going to be a contender, he needs to make a move here after a disappointing Good tally in the medley. Lift. Nine is the target. Good lift. And as Colin says, maybe we shouldn't be expecting the uh, high teens that we've had in some of the earlier heats. Pujanovsky 17, Mark Felix 17 as well. I don't think we're going to see that here. Good lift. Lift. He's got to be careful here. Needs to get his hips through. He's struggling in the real latter part of the movement, oh, right at the top. He's struggling at six. That's not a good sign at all. He needs points here, the American. He's had a regroup, but he's struggling. He may not get to seven. Well, his lower back's like a fishing rod, really bent and not good technique at all. Well, I think the best thing you can say for Josh Thigpen's campaign so far is one man's had to drop out. That's given him a chance because nothing else has gone right for him. Very disappointing. Here's Odd Haugen, for whom the only way is up. The general thinking is that it's tougher to get strong when you get older, but I think it's, it's tougher to be motivated when you're older. Age make you a little more cautious, and uh, may keep you from getting injured as often, but the younger guys have the advantage of having no caution, and as you get older you have a little more caution, but maybe a little more strength. So it's a balance there, but I think that when you can throw caution to the wind, so to speak, and attack the events with high degree of intensity, you can do much better. Well, let's see what grey power can do here in the deadlift. Take your position. The old campaigner, Lift. Odd Haugen. Let's face it, he doesn't have an awful lot to beat, does he? Nine is his target. Lift. If he can get to double figures, he will be in the lead Lift. with only one man Lift. to come. Slavek Tojcik must be looking at Good this lift. field and thinking, I'm fancying Lift. maximum points here. But let's see if Haugen can uh, give lift. him something to target. Lift. Your hips are on. Well, very good, good technique from Haugen. Lift. He's been lifting for 40 years, so I suppose there's good no lift. surprise that he's lift. just so good. Good lift. Yes, lift. you can only last if you're a technician. And he's always been a very accomplished technician. Well, he good has lift. edged past uh, Thick Pen 6. Now, can he match Venter's 9? Up. Good lift. Now, the next one's important. He needs to pinch a point here off Venter. He doesn't want to tie with him. He's got to make points up, and I don't think he's going to do it. But this is important here. But oh, Haugen has just... Well, he knows when he's had enough, and he's been around long enough that you can't second-guess him, but I thought he might have gone for a second attempt at a tenth there. That could be expensive. Well, he only got into Strongman in 1997. Amazing. He won USA's Strongest Man in 98. What would he have been like? if he got there in the early 80s. Oh, with nine repetitions. Is that all you could do? Well, I got a little bit out of a position. When I got tired, you get out of position. So that was all I could do there. You're 56 years old, the oldest man in the competition, oldest competitor ever. You're against guys half your age, and you're whipping them. What's your secret? Well, good, uh, good nutrition, good, uh, you know, staying good for fitness, staying in shape all the time. Do you train literally all day long, 24 hours or, or less? Less than that, but uh, I'm thinking fitness 24 hours a day. Do you think those nine reps will be enough? No. I think Tojek will beat it. Well, you had great form. Keep it up. Thank you. Yes, a, a reali realistic assessment there from uh, Odd Haugen. Slavic Tojek should be able position. to do 10 here right. without breaking a sweat. The interesting thing will be whether he goes on after 10. Lift. 10 will give him maximum points. Does he want to show off or will it be wasting energy Lift. if he does? Let's see. I wouldn't be at all surprised Lift. if he gets to 10, Colin, and he Lift. should do it so easily. He'll, st he'll, he'll say 10. Yeah, Lift. maximum points. I'll take that. Absolutely Lift. right. He'd be very Lift. foolish to do any more Lift. than 10. He's Lift. not a great deadlifter compared to Dimmick and Pudzianowski. So really there's Lift. no point in him trying to do 17 like Marius. Lift. Leave the, the show-off stuff to, to the dominator.
Well, this for a tie. Go flip. But this flip. to take points off the opponents. And sure enough, oh, he's just going to make it, isn't he? Well, I think if he had to get to 11, he might struggle. No, no, no wonder he's going to stop at 10. That 10th one wasn't convincing, but it was enough for maximum points. We have seen better deadlift competitions, but the bottom line is 10 is good enough for maximum points. Odd Haugen was correct then as Slavik Tojcik scraped past him and Sebastian Venter. Josh Thigpen will be disappointed with just six reps. Eastern Europe still rules the top of the table then. Both Venter and Tojcik are looking very assured at this early stage. That impressive effort from Odd Haugen though has at least given the Poles something to think about. Five lumps of steel, five big guys. It's Fingal's fingers time, and when these things start falling, stand well back. Yeah, very good advice, Martin. There they are, the five poles that have to be swiveled through their axis and spun 180 degrees. And the catch is, the lightest of them weighs 440 pounds, they get heavier. 660, if you can get to the fifth finger and flip it. And you've got 75 seconds to do it in. Odd Haugen. He's lifted many Thank fingers you, over the years. Let's see what he does here. He has the disadvantage of competing on his own. A lot of these guys have the adrenaline of seeing somebody racing alongside them and it can push and inspire them. The one thing you've got to do is keep arms and legs working in unison. You can't do it on leg strength alone and you certainly can't do it on arm strength alone. And the thing to watch is if it goes onto the shoulder, usually unless you're very close to the tipping point, that'll be the end of it for you. So how can keeping those straight arms, getting the elbows locked and good technique from a master technician? Well, he knows all the tricks on Haugen. He's got the climbing shoes on. Get a little bit of extra traction off of this marble surface here. There's been a very light rain just before this event. And, well, Haugen gives himself every chance, but I think... The elbows are going. And now that's it. And you would think somebody like Haugen, yeah, he knows that that would have been a total waste of effort. And he had one little think about it and said, you know what? That ain't going to work, is it? Three fingers. For Odd Haugen. Quick time, but he'll be disappointed with that. The rest of the field should beat three. Very disappointing, really, for Odd, who put in a big deadlift just before this. He needed to get up that fourth finger to put the pressure on the others. Josh Thigpen has had an absolute nightmare of a start. Anything that's uh, keeping him in fourth place. His struggles elsewhere. Indeed, he does have to have it. And Magnus Samuelsson. Really suffering with that back, but he's got all the experience in the world. When they called me and asked me to go to World Strongest Man 95, I was not ready for it at all, and I was way too thin, I was thinking. But on the other hand, I knew if I turned them down, they wouldn't call me back again, so I just had to go and I had to do well. And uh, luckily, I did. Of course, winning World Strongest Man, that was a great memory. On the other hand, I really enjoyed Zambia 2001, uh, racing against Sven. Good friend of mine, we had a good race, I kind of messed up uh, in a few events and we won the title for many years, we were always competing mostly against each other, we were also great friends. And those years I think was the most fun. I've seen a lot of people coming and going over the years and I'm, I feel very blessed to be able to be here. It's been a great experience that I will keep with me in my whole life. Take your position! Well, the question is, how does the back hold up? Thigpen needs points, and he needs them desperately. One finger down, they should both move past Old Haugen very quickly indeed. Samuelson's looking good so far. But you start to wonder where Samuelson's going to really feel it. He doesn't seem to be feeling it at the moment, and he's neck and neck with the American. You would have thought it's the point when he picks it up that he'd have most problems. Here is back, really not in too bad a position. And uh, Thigpen rushed off into the lead, but Samuelson building confidence all the time. Yeah, this is the fifth finger, and it's a fast time. That is a terrific effort from Magnus Samuelson. And Thigpen's just got to finish the job here. And if, I think he will, he's keeping it moving. Although the arms are starting to tie up a little bit. Anytime the elbow bends, yeah, as soon as those elbows start to give, 
There's just no way back. Those fingers are cruel and unforgiving. 40.23 for Magnus Samuelsson. Thigpen, well, he's done four fingers in a very fast time. Well, Thigpen's been outstanding throughout the entire summer of Strongman. He comes here to the big one, and he needs a lesson from Magnus on how to step up to the challenge. Magnus, with that back injury, where did all that power come from? I was trying really hard coming into this competition, and I'm very strong right now. I just I'm looking for every, every opportunity to, to show my fans that I'm still here and I was I must admit I was terrified the first two fingers. I was just waiting for the back to pop again but finally I felt, I felt after the first finger this, this might work and then off the second one I just went for it and uh, I could have done this faster of course if I would have been healthy but saying that not many people can do this feeling the way I do right now. Two poles taking on five fingers. Slavek Tojcik never really likes this event as he's admitted to himself. And you just wonder if there's a chance here for Sebastian Venter to grab the overall leadership. If this one goes according to the form, Take your position. Venter should beat his compatriot here and Tojcik doesn't like it. He might drop points. And already the bigger man has built up a, a little lead and look at those arms. A long-armed, six-foot-seven shot putter. Sounds like the ideal man to do fingers, fingers to me. And Venta, he almost looks like he could do this quicker. He's slow in between the, the fingers, but he knows he just needs to beat the time of Samuelson to keep accruing the points. Toyshek's done all right with that fourth, that third finger, rather. But he's got to take this fourth one. Now, 40-23 is the time to beat. And Toyshek doesn't want to know, but that 40.23 is gone. Toychek bailed on that fourth finger, didn't he? He really needed it to move ahead of Thigpen, but Venta absolutely destroyed the field. And a little bit of a Polish conference going on there. Well, these poles are just outstanding, aren't they? Venta, a giant of a man, towering over the fifth. Now that should put him into the overall lead. Very impressive stuff. Things are looking up a little then for the giant Swede. What an amazing effort to get all five fingers over considering his back problems. Sebastian Venter looks untouchable at the top of the table, but Toycheck may just be beginning to look over his shoulder after that event. If Samuelson can somehow keep up this comeback, we could be in for a treat. After the break, find out if the rest of the field can narrow the gap on the leading poles. And I'll be visiting one of Sanya's leading fashion outlets. Sanya is known as the Hawaii of China. And like any town or city in China, it has its fair share of tailors. So, I'm off to get myself suitably attired. All manner of classic cloth is on offer in these places and at a fraction of the price you'd pay in England. But I think I need something a little more in keeping with Sanya's tropical climate. I just hope the tailor understands my requirements. It's made me look slim. No? It's a good job you're not measuring the other guys. Need a bigger tape measure. 